okay, look, I know I'm probably supposed to do the thing where there's a countdown and like you don't join right away. I just don't have the patience for that kind of thing. So I just want to say hello. Hello. Okay, I see. Oh, you know what I should do? I should. I'm not going to do it right now. But for next time, I should make sure that um, the chat is on the starting screen. Uh, Steven, you also haven't read Daggerheart Open Beta. That's that. This will be a fun experience. I don't know how thorough this is all going to be. We'll see. This is... Uh, hello, Steven. Okay, good. Question about the fact that you can see and hear me. Okay, good. And, and, and chat is showing up on screen. Um, question for y'all. Um, how is my visuals? Like, for my screen, I look a little laggy. And I don't know if that is just me or if it is... Um, or, or if that's just... Or if you're experiencing that as well. Low frame rate. Yeah. That's what it's looking like. And I don't know why that is or how to fix it. <laughs> Camera frame rate is very low. It is, isn't it? And this was not the case previously. I don't know why. Hold on. Let me just see if it's just me. Yeah. It is super low. Oops. That's all I meant to do. Why is that? Uh, okay, video capture device. Yeah, if I do... No, obviously that's wrong. Okay, so that's looking fine. So it's not... It's something with the with the camera. All right, well, for now, let's use... Oops, wrong one. Let's use the FaceTime camera. It's not that much worse than my... Right now, it's markedly better than my uh, phone. Um... Yeah, I don't know why it's doing that today. My phone just might need to be restarted. We'll see. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll use that for today. Um, and we'll keep an eye. If it does it again, then it's not. Um, <laughs> I must be using your internet, cool green, green bug. That's a bummer. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, okay. Hello. Hello, folks. Welcome. Um let me, before I forget, I'm just going to write down. Okay. Never mind. That's not something I need to worry about right now. Um, Twitch things to fix. Phone, camera, frame, rate. And what was the other thing? Oh, um, add chat to stream start screen. Um, countdown question mark because I know somebody said that it gave him a little bit of a start when um when there was no countdown and that is something that I want to do I just didn't want to do it today um all right I don't really need these in uh yeah AKL I mean obviously that's a good point audio is so much more important but it would bother me especially because I want to record this for a video like this is going to be in a video in the future probably multiple videos um. Okay, uh, thank you, folks. Hello, Equinox. Hello, Sorted Soup. Hello, AKL. Well, we already we were just talking to AKL. Um, good to see you. Hello, uh, Hem. Hello, Kitarid Draconia. Oh, start. Yes, startled versus frightened is an important distinction, and that is fair. Hello, hello, Smiling Tomatoes. Hello. Akamos, pardon me. Hello, Pippa. Hello, Umblebee. Hello, Admiral. Hello, Griffin. Hello, hello, Brian Wagner. Weg Wagner. Apologies. And hello, Stephen. Okay. So, folks, we are hello, Dan N. Welcome. Uh, alrighty, folks, we are taking a look at Daggerheart today. I doubt I'm gonna make it through all of this today. I will probably only be able to stream until. Oh, you know what? Shoot, hold on. Before I do that, before I accidentally dox myself, let me move this over to this screen. Um, okay. We're back. Um, okay, just want to keep that open. I'll probably only be playing be on stream until like 3 or 3.30 would be my guess. 
Uh, right now it's about it's almost one thirty, so probably two hours. I cause just because I ran a game this morning, and I do not imagine that my voice will love me doing a live stream for super long. <laughs> Jeff said, "Let's see if we can get Mike to do nothing but four hours of hellos." Uh, listen, I will happily say hello to as many folks as possible. Uh, but you, but you, you know, it is a good point. Let's try to see what we can get done today. Hello, Baronessa, welcome. Okay, so. Today we're talking about Daggerheart. Daggerheart is the original RPG being developed by the folks at Critical Role, and it is in open beta as of Tuesday, I believe. And this is the first chance I've had to um, to get to it because this room, which is going to be the, the nursery for the child when they arrive, uh, this room got painted on Tuesday, and then I went to a surprise baby shower that my wife's co-workers held for her. So I have not had the chance to look at Daggerheart at all. Um, but I know a little bit. I've watched Critical Role put out videos where they introduce the game. I've watched it. I don't really know that I've retained a ton of info about that. Um, the... Yeah, Steven, it's so weird how some games are just easier to communicate the title of than just emojis. Very true. Um, so I've watched the intro video to like here's how the game works which it's it's spencer and matt talking about the the way the game works and a lot of it just kind of goes in one ear and out the other I, I don't know why i just was not retaining much from that version of it i learned a lot more i felt like from watching matt and travis create bertrand bell in shadow dark Daggerheart. i'm gonna do that a lot by the way the names are just similar enough that i'm gonna do that a lot um but watching them create Bertrand Bell. And then the third video was watching everyone create their characters. I haven't actually watched the one shot yet, um, but I have watched the other, the character creation videos, which I felt I learned a lot from. But I know not everyone here has, so I'm not going to give any spoilers for those. I'm just going to try to talk about this in the sense of what we know from reading it. However, I'm also going to be very curious about how um, this game reflects other things that Critical Role have done and been excited about. Um, yeah, Griffin, exactly. The Session Zero I thought was really helpful because it was very useful to understand how things might come into play. And it was it was really cool just to see the game starting to be played. So I really liked I thought I've watched the um, the two character creation videos twice already just because I thought that was a lot of fun. And I'm, I'm hoping to play and or run this soon. I do not have a timeline on that yet just because I, I have no idea how I'm going to fit it into my schedule. Um, but I really want to give this a try. I wasn't planning to talk about this at all, by the way. My thinking was there's a lot of games that are coming and going and a lot of them are being play tested. And I just don't have the bandwidth to look at any of them. But this game and one other, which I'm going to talk about on the channel at some point, have piqued my interest enough that I'm like, okay, I would like to give this a play test if I have the time. And right now, I I feel like I have a little time. Uh, Equinox, you said, having run the adventure for your friends, you think it falls a little flat? Very very possibly. Um, I want to run the pre-written adventure, but I, I will probably be giving them feedback to that as well, and we'll see what the response to it is. Addy, you wish they released a more GM-focused video? Yeah, I, I do kind of get the um the appeal for that as well yeah I, there is, really isn't anything like that yet but i think that's part of why i'm excited to just try check this out as a player uh, there's some stuff in here that makes me kind of excited to try it as a player um so yeah so let's dig in first of all this is open play test uh, an open beta play test everything here is up for grabs any of it can be changed and any of it probably we should expect will be changed just to manage our expectations appropriately. So keep that in mind. Don't get too locked into any of this. This is exactly why I haven't been talking about it yet. Um, but I do want to give this a try. Um, the art is subject to change. Some pieces are placeholders. Others are closer to finalization and some are simply not ready yet. Okay, good. I was wondering about this. The domain cards all share one image per domain and all subclass cards within a current a class currently have the same art. Each will have their own custom art in the final release. Okay. That is one of the things that I have definitely been keeping an eye on in um, other videos and, and playtests that I've seen people like talking about it online and been like, oh, 
I wish these cards each had their own art. They will, so I don't need to leave a comment about that. It's good to know. Uh, I should actually take a look at these. Uh, active development, blah, blah, blah. Yep, we've talked about that. The rule book has not got through an editor yet. Okay. Okay, so don't worry about typos or grammar unless they're actually unless they actually seem to change the meaning of something. Okay, it's good to know. <clears throat> Balancing of adversaries is still in an exploratory phase. That's a very interesting way to phrase that. We've adjusted the combat system numerous times in an effort to make it as fast as cinematic as we can while also making it feel familiar and fair. Combat will need significant playtesting to ensure we get the right balance on class power, leveling, adversaries, and beyond. We love your feedback when you feel like things aren't working. Yeah. I am really thinking that I am not going to look too much at GM materials yet, at least until I get a chance to play, which is hopefully going to happen soon. I'm going to focus more on the player-facing stuff. But this is something that I'm very curious about. Because one of the things that I know is this game borrows a lot from Powered by the Apocalypse or um, Forged in the Dark games. But in terms of how the dice rolls work. At least especially... And that's not entirely... That's reductive. There's a lot of influences on this game. And, and it is original enough based on everything that's been pulled from other games that I'm not, I'm not calling it... I'm not accusing anything of anything. But one of the things that I noticed is that in Powered by the Apocalypse games... You know, you roll your t your two dice, you add them up, you see if you hit the threshold, and based on whether you succeeded or failed is whether or not the, you take damage. And that is not how this game works. So I'm very curious how this system is going to approach a very different approach to damage. And I know that the, one of the things they're doing is that you have a d20 rolled by the GM and a d12s are rolled by the heroes, and I I don't know... I I know that it's very deliberate, We'll talk about that later, but I am going to be very curious how adversaries feel, but I won't be able to comment on that until we do an actual playthrough of it, and I think I have two groups that are probably going to do a playthrough of it. The development of a modular setting system is still in an exploratory stage. We'll see the beginnings of it here, but the plan is to roll out more as the playtest progresses. Okay, that's interesting. That is good to know, because I had some concerns when I saw the Session Zero and watched the cast of Critical Role creating the world together I definitely had some worries about how you make that something everyone can do I'm glad to see that they're still working on that again the GM side of things I'm not going to worry about too much but that's something else until maybe a later stream that's something I'm definitely keeping an eye on though we talked about the art already release new updates periodically during the open beta test open beta playtest cycle I'm very curious what the timeline is going to be on those because I know with the Dungeons and Dragons playtest, it was like every couple months, usually, like two months or so. But we'll see. You can stream your games, make it clear this is using the Dragonheart playtest, because they'll continue to evolve. Yep, okay. And don't sell or publish anything yet, because we don't want you to publish anything with unfinished rules, which makes perfect sense. Okay, let's look at touchstones real quick. Um, TTRPGs, 13th Age, which I don't, I have not played, but I know of. I don't know anything about, though. Apocalypse World, The Blades in the Dark, yep. City of Mist, I know that Megaphone Man, when he was doing a live stream, talked a lot about the City of Mist influence. And there's a lot of, it seems like what, at least what, what Jack noticed as being similar, what Megaphone Man noticed as being similar to City of Mist is something I've encountered in other games, which is the experiences. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons, Flea Mortals, yeah, it's appropriate. Um, Masks, okay. Pathfinder, Shadowrun, Quiet Year. Oh, sure, Quiet Year. I can definitely see the influence on that, on that how the map worked. Yeah, okay. Uh, books, Song of Ice and Fire, Wizards of Earthsea, Sabriel, Wheel of Time, Lord of the Rings. Wow, that is a short list. That is a really short list. It, like, isn't... Shouldn't Redwall be on here? You'd think, right, given the sort of the creatures that we've seen? There's not a ton of whimsy on this list. I mean, I, I, I guess I don't know the tone of these three, really, because I haven't read any of those. <clears throat> but I feel like there should be a lot more whimsy on this list. Maybe, uh, I don't know. This is sort of very, like, basics. Without including Brandon Sanderson, this is, like, the basics. Are you interested in fantasy? You should check these out list interesting movies and tv 
Dragon Prince, interesting. I again, I haven't, I haven't seen it, but I'm aware that it's a big influence, uh, or that it's very, um, you know, it's probably tonally very similar to Avatar: The Last Airbender. So I'm glad that's on the list. That's kind of where some of the women's is present, and of course, of course, Legend of Vox Machina is going to be an influence. Um, I'm surprised Witcher is on TV and not video games, because that interesting. Hmm. Um, okay. Special appreciations. Genesis system was a major appreciation. Yes. Okay. Oh, that's a good, that's a good point. Uh, always are in, uh, yes. Technically, if you're recommending <laughs> the wheel of time, you are recommending Brandon Sanderson. That's a good point. Uh, cause he did the last three books. Yeah, Baronessa, basics and more likely to be known by a current audience, which is why no Moorcock or Vance are on the list. Well, and and Moorcock and Vance... Okay, Brian says uh, Wheel of Time is not whimsical in any way. For the record, good to know. Um, Moorcock and Vance might not be influences on them, which is totally fine. They don't have to be. Um, it's possible that no one at Darrington Press feels like the Moorcock books or Jack Vance are in line with what they're picturing. Or maybe they haven't read them, or maybe they're not interested in them. And that's that's totally fine. I'm just... I'm a little surprised at how short this list is. I mean, I say short. There's five books in this series. There's many, many books in the Wheel of Time series. So these are not short. It's not a small amount of books. It's just a small amount of franchises, which, fair enough. Um, okay, the Genesis system. Genesis system is Fantasy Age, which makes a lot of sense because Fantasy Age... No, I'm sorry, no. I'm sorry, I'm thinking of the wrong thing. Not Fantasy Age. Genesis is it's a version of what the Star Wars RPG used. And I definitely see the influence there. Because that's something... And I know when Mega was streaming about this, he was sort of scratching his head at how the dice mechanics demand something different of the GM. You have to come up with a lot more possibilities for success with a hope, success with a fear, um, failure with a hope, failure with a fear, and then a critical... And those are things straight out of the Genesis system, which is what the Fantasy Flight... It's the same I couldn't come up with. Fantasy Flight is the company that made the Star Wars RPG, and I believe they have their own Genesis system, though I don't know anything about it. Um, and did they do... Did the Warhammer RPG as well at some point? I don't know if they did the current one. But with the Warhammer RPG, at least one that I know Matt Colville's talked about on his channel, I don't know if it's the, if it's the current version, but... I know it used the same system of you roll these funky dice and using those dice, you can figure out all of these different. Um... Yeah, Steven, exactly. It's the one where reading dice results looks like reading tea leaves, basically. And I think that what uh, Daggerheart does, which is really smart, is it finds a way to drastically simplify that system. Because I know the MCDM RPG, I have not playtested it and I haven't been involved in the Patreon during the time of playtesting, but... I know that the core idea behind the the dice that Matt, uh, that Matt Colville talked about that they were experimenting with was to try their own dice and their own systems, and it was a challenge. I think what Darrington has gone the other direction is say, okay, what if we were trying to replicate this approach but simplify it dramatically? And I think that's a smart... <laughs> I think that's a really smart solution, you know, because they've based their game on the normal... Um, D20 sets of dice that we can all find at a hobby shop. If you're playing Critical Roles, uh, Tal'Dorei Reborn in D&D 5e, you already have the dice you need. Um, so I think that that is a, a major influence that I've seen and that I think is really smart. There's something else I was going to say about it as well. It is also kind of like dipping your toes into a more advanced version of resolving rules than and resolving roles than not just D20 fantasy, but also than power by the apocalypse because it demands a lot more because power by the apocalypse is really just, you succeed, you fail or some middle ground you have to find. And this is just a much more nuanced version of that even. And I like the system. Um, I think it works well. Um, so I'm excited to see, I'm excited to see this version of it where they simplified it a lot. Um, which I think was smart. Yeah, Steven, that's a good point. And that, that may be something the GMs have. I don't know. I haven't seen it. 
but if not, it would be helpful to give them a list of potential, okay, what do you get? Like, what does it look like? But also part of it is the fun is you really do have to figure that out in the moment. And that's sort of the challenge with those sorts of systems, which is why, which is why the systems aren't for everybody. You know, not everyone likes those sorts of systems. But this is the thing I was going to say. One of the things that, and I know Mega talked about this as well. Apologies, I'm going to reference that live stream a lot because he talked for like five hours about the game. And I haven't even watched the character creation one because I want to leave my own decisions on that. Um, but the thing about Critical Role is they always talk about the dice tell a story. I mean, I just talked about an episode of Critical Role where like there were a lot of natural 20s. The dice told the story. But when the dice tell the story in D20... But when the dice tell a story in D20 Fantasy, they can only tell yes or no questions. They can only give you yes or no answers. It really is in those moments where, oh, wow, okay, the dice wanted X to happen instead of Y. But it's such a binary system by default. This doesn't mean it's always the case, but when we say in Critical Role, the dice told the story, we are often talking about those binary results. You know, Grog's final strike against Kevdak. Uh, Vex convincing the herd to fall in line with Grog. Vex in the trap in episode 44 of uh, the Vox Machina campaign. Those are major dice tell a story moment. There are a few times, no, even even the final divine intervention of campaign two is still a binary result. It's still yes or no. You know, anytime the dice tell a story in Critical Role has often been yes or no results. What this does, which I think is really smart, is it takes a lot of the load off of those major moments happening to be the moments that someone rolls something specific and instead says, what if we take that concept and we really extend it out and we make sure the dice are always telling the story or telling some version of a story. And I think that that is really, really clever design. Because one of the things that I've been thinking about ever since they announced their game is how do you make this game feel like Critical Role? You know, for example, when they published their adventure through Wizards of the Coast, um, what was the, what was it called? Call of the Netherdeep. When they published Call of the Netherdeep, they had that question, right? Which is, how do you make this feel like Critical Role? How do you make a D&D adventure feel like it feels to play Critical Role or watch Critical Role? And their solution was, let's make sure there are engaging NPCs that evolve and have a changing relationship with the party over time. So you have this rival party that has a maturing and developing relationship with the player characters as time goes on. That was something they were very conscious of because Critical Role is a brand. How do you identify that Critical Role is bringing what makes that game exciting to their product? And the thing I was thinking about a lot with the development of Daggerheart is we're not just going to learn, you know, what how, how you put Critical Role, how you translate Critical Role into its own game system, we're going to learn what Critical Role thinks they are. Because what they choose to put into their own game tells us what they think is essential to making Critical Role Critical Role. Right? Because if they had just put out a system like... Um, oh, shoot. This is why I script my videos. Um, oh, what is it called? There's an indie RPG... I can't... It's described as, like, the Coen Brothers RPG. Uh, Fiasco. If they had just put out a system like Fiasco that was entirely NPCs and PCs and, like, it's, it's about player characters arguing with each other and, like, and, and who wins certain scenes role-playing-wise, I think that would be a strange choice given every other thing that we associate with Critical Role being high combat and, and intense maps and things like that. But also, that would have been very interesting. It would have said, oh, okay, this is what Critical Role thinks we think their campaigns are like and what they want to put their best foot forward as campaigns. And so I think it's really interesting that what we're getting is something where there are shades of gray in the dice results, which we often don't have in D20 Fantasy. Now, as someone's pointing out in the chat, it seems like there have been moments in the past in Critical Role where that has been Matt's intention and it hasn't been possible because that's kind of not how D20 Fantasy works. But now they're developing a system where they can get that more easily. And I think that's really smart. I think that's really smart design. Also, with the Dungeon Master using a D20 in this game, 
I'm like 40% sure that's only there because Critical Role uh, uses a D20 in their logo. Now, that being said, I know that their argument in the game system is we want to use a D20 for the monsters because we want there to be more of a risk of failure and more of a chance that the heroes are going to succeed versus the monsters, and that's a much more swingy game. Whereas if they were... If the bad guys rolled 2d12s, then you have a much different approach to damage thresholds and all these things. We'll see how I feel when we actually get into um, playing it and see how that feels. So I won't be able to comment too much on it. But that is... I understand why they got there. I think that makes sense. I'm not 100% convinced they didn't work backwards from the d20. (laughs) Because they didn't... You know, if you start with, hey, we're going to have the players roll 2d12, you're going to pretty quickly run into... Oh shoot! A lot of things have to change if the GM rolls two d twelve. I mean, that's why GMs don't roll in Powered by the Apocalypse because the players basically determine whether they take damage based on how they rolled. So I think it's a smart compromise. We'll have to see how it actually feels in at the table. Um, and I think it's very purposeful. I think it also helps that they do have a d twenty in their logo, which fair enough. Yeah, the movie, I loved the art for the Critical Role one-shot. Um, I thought it was fantastic. Oh, hey, Mega's here. Hello. Uh, yes. Yeah, and then that's the thing, too, is there is going to be, this is the, this is the strange thing about a, T, a 2D12 system. There's going to be a bell curve of results. So on average, you're not going to get the highest possible result. You're going to get the middle. And that's really interesting and i don't know how i feel about that because when i'm playing powered by the apocalypse games at least recently (laughs) i don't know if that's always been the case but at least recently i felt like we only ever got mid-range results we only ever got um succeed with a complication or whatever whatever it's called in in um in monster of the week i don't remember the term i don't know how that will feel in a game where combat is a much bigger deal. But I also think that's why the shades of success and failure and the hope and fear is a very important mechanic because you want it to feel like the story is still moving forward. No, the Mao, you, you, you do add the 2d12, don't you? Is that not the case? I thought it was. I guess we'll find out. Maybe I have the maybe I'm understanding this wrong. You roll the other dice and take the sum of the results. Yeah, so you add you add the two D twelve together. Plus any modifiers. And then you're trying to hit a DC set by the GM. So obviously the D the D twelves are gonna have to be lower. Or sorry. Obviously, the DCs are going to have to be lower in this game, um, which is fine. It's just really funny to me that I'm I'm still in the phase of Critical Role. I think I'm just leaving it in my Demystified series where they're just starting to learn that the DCs don't have to be as high as they were in Pathfinder. And now people are going to have to go through that again when they're transitioning from D25, uh, um, when they're transitioning from 5th edition to Daggerheart, where the DCs are going to have to be even lower than they were before. Um, yeah, AKL, again, that's that's very purposeful. Um, Spencer, and it's good to know Spencer specifically said it, because the PC is generally com- competent. Um, the Maui, yeah, there is a higher crit chance. Um, I don't believe it's by a lot, but it is by more, for sure. Um, which is going to be very interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, this is a session. This is how it works. Open the campaigns every week or two. Ha! Huh? Oh, if only. Um, no winning or losing. Yeah, I'm just seeing if there's anything interesting they put in here. Uh, character death. I We're going to talk about that in a minute when we get to the character death section. I may have to jump to some sections that I really want to talk about based on what I've seen. And character death is one of them. I really want to talk about. 8.3% instead of 5%. Okay, that's closer than I thought, actually. I thought it was going to be like 10 or 9. Yeah, 8.3. 
Yeah. So not that much more likely, but still enough. Oh, that's true. The advantage system does change that result as well. Uh, I'm going to mute myself to sneeze. I'm back. <laughs> okay. This is an interesting passage to include in a playtest. The most important rule of Daggerheart is that you make the game your own. The rules included in this manuscript are designed to help you have an enjoyable experience at the table, but they should never get in the way of a story you want to tell, characters you want to play, or adventures you want to have. As long as your table agrees, everything can be adjusted to your group's playstyle. If there's a rule you'd rather ignore, a modification that works better for you, feel free to implement it. But for right now, we shouldn't do that, because we do need to make sure that... We need to make sure we're playing with the game rules they gave us to see how it actually feels. <laughs> um, yeah, Megaphone, there, there are no crit fails, which is interesting. That's a good point. And that's curious, because I don't think crit fails... How do I phrase this? I think we are at the point in the development of the hobby now that crit fails aren't part of skill checks, that crit fails don't feel super fun anymore. Because what you used to have is crit fails would have, like, oh, critical fail decks you know you'd have like a chart or whatever and some people still do that and some games still do that but that's not really part of the culture of 5e so if you're taking that culture and you're pitching them a new game eliminating the chance to crit fail is it kind of makes sense I, like i don't think i don't think there are many failing with fear is the closest thing you get to a crit uh, to a crit fail that's true that's true it's actually more common because of that um yeah, it's complicated because the difference between failing with fear and a crit fail is that failing with fear is guaranteed to move the story forward. So is failing with hope. Uh, how much does the D6 advantage affect crit chance? I'm going to have to leave that to people to determine. Um, Dude and Fuzz, uh, you hate botch slash fumble mechanisms. You're glad most games kick that. Well, and, and including a crit fail tells you a lot about the game, right? I'm playing a game Shadow Dark right now or i'm running a shadow dark campaign and because if you crit fail you might lose the chance to cast a spell until a long rest that makes a huge difference actually if you fail casting a spell let me rephrase if you fail to cast a spell in shadow dark you can't cast it again until a long rest if you crit fail you can't where's that thumbs up from that was weird um if you crit fail then you can't cast it again until you do some role playing. You either have to, um, oh no no I'm sorry I'm sorry I'm, I'm I'm misspeaking. Let me rephrase. Let me take this whole sentence again. This is again why I film these videos in advance. When you crit fail on casting a spell in Shadow Dark, if you're a wizard, you roll on a wild basically a wild magic table, and if you are a priest, you can't cast that spell again until you go and commit a ritual to your god and you give up some sort of monetary significance uh, in ritual atonement. So it pushes you, it pushes the story forward still. And it moves more towards um, failure, you know, a, a magic, a wild magic effect or whatever they call it in Shadow Dark, going off in the middle of a combat is going to be pretty significant if you're in the middle of a dungeon. Meanwhile, if you're doing a ritual as a priest, you're going to lose something of monetary significance which is actually um what you're going into these dungeons for so either way it is a pretty severe punishment but they're also more interesting you know and they and they fit the tone of that game better since that's not generally how 5e works i think it makes sense that they've eliminated crit fails whether they meant to or not also i saw somebody earlier ask um Basically, do we think that Critical Role is going to be playing Daggerheart for Campaign 4? Now, I'm I'm behind on Campaign 3 by, like, a year. So I don't know how close they are to the end of Campaign 3, like, how, how whether it seems like they're going to wrap that up. I think it is so unlikely that they're not going to play Daggerheart for Campaign 4. I think there was a more interesting question of saying, are they for sure going to be in the same world in Campaign 4? Again, I haven't... No spoilers for Campaign 3. I don't know 
whether the world seems like it's still going to be there or not. Because I know around this time in every campaign, you start to wonder if the world's still going to be there for the next campaign. But, like, I think they could play in the same world. They could also choose to play in the in a new world. But I I would be more interested to see them play in the same world. Because also, that's the same world they've got. They're going to have two Amazon shows in by the time um, Daggerheart comes out as an official product. Yeah, Mackie, you you brought up a good point. So they they're going to be this. They're probably going to be the same world because they showed you you can bring characters into your world. But that's also useful for them to know. Hey, you could just change your characters over right now and start playing in Daggerheart. They also showed in the session zero, you had them take a map and start putting places onto the map, which is something we'll talk about later. Uh, I'm I have no doubt of that. But so they've shown us both processes. I think it's valuable to show people, hey, you're going to create a little world for this one shot or, you know, or for this game. Like, this is a thing you could do, and we're going to do it for this one shot. Um, yeah, I'll be very interested to see that. Uh, Zormar, more interesting question is, will any other actual play play Daggerheart? Oh, I've already seen another actual play playing Daggerheart. Um, Nerdy Nightly are doing a Daggerheart live stream, and we'll see if anybody else goes... Um, goes to that system once it's actually officially published, but I would imagine so. Because it's it lends itself really well to that. Because this is something and this is something that came up in Mega's stream as well. Somebody commented in the chat and said, you know, a system where the story always moves forward on a success or failure works really well for live streaming. So I think it's gonna be tempting for a lot of reasons. I think the reason that people don't do the Genesis system for live streams, which is the Star Wars system is because it takes too damn long to build the dice pools. It's really, really difficult to make that system engaging and exciting when you have to spend forever building a dice pool. If you're doing an edited podcast, it's easier to get around that. But even so, it still cuts into your session time. If it's just 2d12, maybe plus a 6, that's a lot simpler. Yeah, Addy, that's another good point. Something I've been thinking about a lot. They have been renaming the races in Exandria to be the same thing they're called in Daggerheart. Ooh, pardon me. That almost, to me, either guarantees... Well, I mean, they could do it either way, but... Pardon me. I feel like it's it's an uh, it's a no-brainer. But then again, I'm the person who thought for Campaign 3 they really should have just cut the party in half and had Matt, Matt run two different games... Because and start bringing other people in as well because I feel like they need to get people used to the idea that some of these players won't be playing the same game system forever. So I've been wrong about this stuff before. Like, I'm not going to die on this hill. Um, I just think it would be very silly if they didn't for, follow the exact same format they do now, but a shorter campaign and do it in Daggerheart. That is the... Um, that's my expectation. That being said, this also depends on when the campaign ends, right? If the campaign ends tomorrow uh, and they all get a tpk well maybe we're gonna see a lot of candela streams and a lot of Daggerheart playtests in a new world and then they're gonna commit to a game down the road we'll see yeah mackie and that's there's no way they don't play Daggerheart on stream the question is just is that what campaign four is and like why wouldn't you you know but again I don't work there. There are many creative choices that the folks at Critical Role have made that I might have made a different one. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more about these rules. We are very short. We are not very far into these. I'm also going to stand up. Yeah, yeah, the Maui, they don't want to they don't want to be tied to Wizards of the Coast forever. Certainly not after the cap past couple of years. Okay. Player principles. Oh, these are useful. Be a fan of their your character and their journey. Ooh, find ways to show off what your character does best and what they do worst. Push your character story forward and always strive to make interesting choices. Learn more about who they are through play and let them grow through the fiction. Okay. I like the focus on Failure as well. That's very critical role, but we'll see how how much that actually uh, 
fits into the um, culture around the game that will develop, but hopefully it's there. Spotlight your allies. I really like that they put this here. We'll see if it's mechanical at any point. Play to find out what happens. Yeah, we were just talking about that. Address the characters and address the players. So I like this, because this is something that I think helps with the whole, this is what my character would do, which is um, speak to other characters within the world of the fiction, ask the other players what their character might do next and what they want to see happen in the narrative and consider their preferences when you play. Um, you know, literally like two hours ago, one of my players got infected with lycanthropy. And the first thing I messaged him afterwards was like, what do you want to see happen next? There's a lot of different ways we could go with this. What do you want to see happen next? Yeah, Elijah, I, again, from what I've seen of campaign three, it wouldn't surprise me if they put a bow on it. That's why I'm not, that's why I don't want to die on the hill of they are definitely going to be in Exandria. I think it, I think it being campaign four and Daggerheart makes perfect sense. I would be surprised, but not shocked if campaign four wasn't, if, if campaign four was no longer in Exandria. Hold on gently. Ooh, interesting. Improvisational storytelling isn't always perfect, and that's okay. Hold on gently to the fiction enough that you don't lose the pieces that matter, but not so tightly that the narrative has no room to breathe. Make mistakes and make changes. Smooth the edges and shape them to fit. Okay. I That's something that... None of these have examples in them, which is fine for most of them. I don't... I don't know that I kind of know what they mean by this, and having an example would be beneficial i think but i don't know none of them really have examples I just, i'm gonna be curious how they communicate that because i'm not even sure what they mean by that other than yeah that's that's an interesting passage build the world together yep we saw that now this is really interesting because oh wait, hang on let's let's talk a little bit more about okay i want to talk about the way they develop worlds after um i read through this section in Daggerheart, every participant is a storyteller, not just the GM. Daggerheart is a very collaborative game, perhaps more so than other games. <laughs> Daggerheart is a very Daggerheart is a very collaborative game, perhaps more so than other games you're used to. Hmm, what game could they be talking about, folks? <laughs> That's a subtweet. And reaches its greatest potential when every player, PCs and GMs, is working together. This means actively advocating for the story beats you want to see, offering suggestions to enrich the arcs of the other player characters, creating parts of the world with others at the table. We'll talk about that a lot more in a minute. And thinking deeply about your characters' motivations. Following these principles will help guide players in creating exciting, predictable, and meaningful stories. World overview. Great magic, wondrous landscapes, mythical beasts, and powerful foes. The world is something you are encouraged to build together at the table. You may, of course, always choose to use an existing location you're already familiar with or a supplemental setting book. Otherwise, utilize the campaign kit in part four to generate a campaign world collaboratively at your table. And the way that works is you take a look at a map. <laughs> choose one of the maps starting in section pending. Um, oh, you know what? I have them on. I've downloaded the material. Are they only online? Campaign maps. Okay. Okay. Okay, I have them here. Here's one, here's two, and here's three. Okay, so you can only download these through the website. You can't get them through um, Demi... Ooh, Flying Floating Castle. Ooh, interesting. Okay, okay. I know one of these, I think it may have been this one, was the one they used in the one-shot. Yeah, it was that. It was that last one. Oh, interesting. Okay, I'm glad they include multiple maps. That's really good. Yeah, Stephen, it's not just a dig at uh at D and D, but it is kind of. Uh, okay, where were we? Um, okay. Create a world campaign world collaboratively at your table. Because this game has established ancestries, communities, classes, abilities, and spells, some aspect of the world will exist similarly in every campaign. These can always be reflavored or modified to match the style of game you all want to play, but understanding the core realms is a good place to start. Okay. Mortal realm. Land, sea, and sky of the world where the mortals live out their lives. Mm hmm. Stories say this realm was created by the forgotten gods during the earliest age, and when they were overthrown by the new gods, many were. Whoa! That's interesting. And when they were overthrown by the new gods, many were banished to this realm. Many, many were, 
and when they were overthrown by the new gods, many were banished to remain in this realm eternally. This realm is also occupied by the faint divinities, the more common lesser gods created by both the forgotten and new to oversee the mortal realm. Okay, really starting to feel like we might be going with a new game system for Campaign 4. I'm sorry, new game setting, because that's... Or jumping way ahead in the future, because that's a big change. And an interesting one, by the way. That is my... That's the kind of thing I love. Um, Ooh, I really like that. The Hallows Above. Collection of realms where many of the gods reside, having been claimed by the new gods at the end of the earliest age. Because this place is more closely connected with the most other realms, the gods here can see and speak with the people of the mortal realm without leaving their realm, sure. Through the methods of communication may appear strange and obfuscated to those they choose to engage with. There are ways by which the gods can leave the hallows above to occupy other realms, but they must always sacrifice something of importance to them to do so. It is rumored that the sacrifice is the cause behind some of the great calamities that have befallen the mortal realm. Interesting. Okay. So it's when the gods get involved that things that major upheavals happen or even just one of the gods. Ooh, that's interesting. Yeah. In singularity, it is a little bit Greek mythos inspired. Interesting. Yeah. Maybe a bit of a God slayer vibe. Oh, T-Rox. I'm really glad you enjoyed legal kimchi's channel. Yeah. He's amazing. Yeah. He's a fantastic, um, fantastic video creator. And if you haven't watched legal kimchi, go watch his stuff. It's awesome. The circles below, those are the, those are the bad, those are the bad ones. The circles below are a collection of lower realms where the fallen reside. Ooh, the fallen. I like that. I mean, it's basic, but I like it. The fallen gods lost the divine war. There's always a divine war <laughs> in every mythology. With the new gods during the ancient age have been since been deemed evil practitioners of tainted magic. Thus, the beings that were banished alongside them, along with those sired since, bear the weight of that identifier. The circles below is considered a place of corruption, destruction, and endless hunger. Stories say this realm is home to some of the most dangerous creatures in the core realms. Other planes have safeguards against fallen who may wish to cross over from the circles below. Within the mortal realm, there's a little typo there, but it's fine. It's rumored that the use of arcane magic in acts of great evil can open a temporary rift between the two lands, allowing the fallen to pass through. Okay, that's cool. There are countless realms beyond these, the elemental lands, the astral realm, the valley of death, and endless others. These are not typically accessible or traversable by those from the mortal realm, but in some, the core realm do carry the knowledge of their existence. Oh, but some in the... Okay, I see. These are not typically accessible or traversable, but some people know about them. Okay. Okay. Yes, yeah, Stephen, they definitely switched to D&D from Pathfinder because the same things we were talking about earlier with um, the Genesis... A, um, how whatever that's called with fantasy ages no sorry with the genesis rpg or in the star wars rpg like it just moves too slow at the table yeah the f well ooh, that's a good point are the fallen gods the old gods does kind of seem that way brian Ooh, that's an interesting i hadn't quite made that connection but yeah interesting so so here's the thing that I was thinking of. As soon as I saw that they were building their own world together, I was like, oh, of course. That makes perfect sense. Because that's what happened with Campaign 1 of Critical Role. Before, you know, before it was what it was, is like, Taliesin was like, hey, I'm from someplace called Whitestone. And Matt was like, okay, there's someplace called Whitestone on the list. And one of the things that I do feel like we've been trending toward with Critical Role, because with Campaign 2, that didn't happen. Campaign 2, Matt had a lot more stuff established is my understanding and his players came to him and were like okay i have this idea for a character and he'd said okay they're from here and they're from here and you get to campaign three and no spoilers here for the people who haven't seen it but there's a lot more of the players leaning on their pre-existing knowledge of what they already know about the world right characters are from places we've already seen people be from from before and they have knowledge that uh, it's not a lot more stuff ties into Taldori because they were making a whole cartoon about it. So, of course, they were, you know, more tied into that kind of stuff. And it does start to feel like we are losing blank spaces on the map. And it definitely, I, I definitely can see the appeal to making a new world because of that. Singularity Orbit, you say, I'm not really happy with the fallen equals evil here. In-world folks would think that, but losing a war doesn't make people instantly evil. Probably true of the gods as well. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the point, actually. It just says they lost the divine war, 
and have been banished and been deemed evil practitioners of tainted magic. It doesn't say they are actually evil. They're, they're just all considered to be evil. It's considered a place of endless corruption and endless hunger, but that's a punishment. I think this is much more like when the wildlings are trapped on the wrong side of the wall of ice, and now they're just considered evil monsters. And it's like, well, that's not really fair now, is it? But it is what happened. Now, that kind of ties into some of the betrayer gods approach that we've seen a little bit, but not quite. I think this is kind of its own thing, and I think it's interesting. It's kind of like if you had Jack Kirby's new gods up here and Jack Kirby's Thor and Asgard and all those folks trapped down here, right? Which is sort of implied to be the origin of the new gods is that they were, they did overthrow the gods that we know from our world. At least from what, from what little I've, I understand, you know, yeah, history written by the victors. Now, I think that's enough wiggle room that they can go either way, right? This could just be Asmodeus, and Asmodeus is bad and is evil. We've seen versions of that before many, many times. Or the others, yeah, the others from, well, the others from Lost are pretty complicated, but I see your, I see your point. I think it's a relevant, it's a relevant connection. Um, but I think there's wiggle room here of like, yeah, they lost... This is the kind of thing that I wish was more common with the creatures. I wish we had more of in D&D, right? Groomsh lost a war. Loth lost a war. And they got banished. But we're meant to assume that they're bad. But they don't have to be. And I'm starting to feel like, and they may not give us any more gods than this, except in their own world that they develop. But you're kind of encouraged to say, yeah, there's a lot of room for nuance there. But the whole point is, the... Uh, I really like they're they're including an approach for you building a world with your friends because that's what they did. And they had a heck of a lot of fun doing it. You know, Marisha came up with the Ashari, which means she created four locations in the entire world of Exandria just when she created that character. The fire, air, water, and earth Ashari towns or locations or whatever they are. Likewise, you have the creation of um, Whitestone, which we just talked about. And Draconia was another one. Draconia was created because uh, Orion said his character was from Draconia. I think those are the only major ones from Campaign 1 that I'm th I can think of. Because Scanlan rarely ever refers to a being from a place... Oh, well, the twins. The twins could have created or at least come up with enough material for Matt to draw on uh, for Singborn. You know, maybe by Rodin, maybe not. Um, we don't really know. That I mean, that one feel, felt really vague. They could have come up with that name. Who knows? But definitely the creation of Singorn is relevant. Um, and Pike was created when they went to Western, so not quite the same. Um, I know a lot of folks are talking about, you know, how successful can this game be or can any of these games be? Uh, there's a really interesting conversation on the, what was the podcast? Eldritch Lorecast, on the Eldritch Lorecast, where they talked about how, you know, RPGs don't really make a lot of money. For someone like Critical Role, a, an RPG is more like merch than it is like a whole business model, um, which is going to be really interesting. Uh, Michi, we're talking about the Critical Role game Daggerheart, which is an open beta, and we're talking about Right now, we're talking about some of the ways that the development of the game reflects things that we've seen before in Critical Role and how it sort of is, is they're trying to gamify their play style, which I think is really interesting. Okay, flavoring your game. So this is kind of interesting. So the way the game system works is that every class has two domains that it's attached to and they share a domain with each domain is shared between two classes we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second and there is kind of a limitation there where it's like okay you can't necessarily do every version of the rogue through that this is kind of how they're getting around that just you're gonna if you want to go beyond the the field of those uh specific ideas of subclasses you're gonna need to do some reflavoring at least until they put out new publications Steven, exactly. You can do collaborative world building in Pathfinder and in 5th edition and, and in lots of games, but they're not built assuming that you're going to. Now, we'll see how much they actually do gamify that, 
but it's going to be interesting to see that that's definitely part of the intention of the design. Yeah, and that's a good point. Is is um is that part of the reason that Campaign Three feels so different? I don't even think it has to do with whether or not they helped build the world. I think it has to do with how much they know about the world. At least from my perspective, rewatching a little bit of the beginning of Campaign One, or sorry, sorry beginning of Campaign Three, there's a lot more of like, oh, my character would know about this. Because those characters helped save the world, so we would all kind of have heard of them, just kind of by definition. You know, the the walls, there's a lot less room to paint in Exandria than there used to be. Let's see. Two to five player characters, so they're not doing single player, fair enough. Not really designed for it. Brian Wagner, I'm going to be very curious how I feel about the domains when we get to it. My feeling is I, I definitely see what they're going for. It is, definitional, it is definitionally more limiting than what we have in D&D. I'm not convinced that's a bad thing. It's just automatically more limiting. Um... Let's see. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Game master. Respond to choices. A lot of this is kind of the basic stuff. They're calling them adversaries. Okay, fair enough. You need some term besides just monsters or villains. <laughs> um, don't be an antagonistic force against the players. Your job is to challenge them. Be a fan of the players. Use the full set of polyhedral dice. It's really fascinating to me that they are, but okay, fair enough. Not a bad, not a bad decision, because hard for people just to get their hands on d12s alone. Character tokens, um, small object that represent the look and feel of your character. Okay, tokens to help count your modifiers. One token to the action tracker. Interesting. Gather about seven tokens per player. That is really interesting. They want you to have that many tokens. Like, does it, like, I have to bring seven pennies. You can't have seven pennies. You need to use seven nickels. You know, Dave needs to use seven dimes. Um, yeah, you know, Stephanie needs to use seven Mancala pieces. That's interesting. I didn't realize they had to be distinct like that. I would really appreciate... Yeah, uh, that's really interesting that I said that. Uh, Eek Walker, you say, the section has a board game-like feeling. This is where I really would wish there was a starter set that you could just punch out colored tokens out of, like, cardstock, you know? Or say something like, use a D4. We're not going to use them in the game that much. Put a D4 down. I don't know. Uh, yeah, plastic gems, pennies, buttons, etc. No large, recommend no larger than a quarter and sit on the table without rolling away. They should ideally have a distinct appearance for your character so they won't get confused with someone else's. Yeah, but here's the question is, I'm curious how much each of these mechanics, I'm curious about this, we'll have to see. Game cards... Because the cards are already kind of a requirement. Seven poker chips. Yeah, poker chips really... <laughs> Pogs, exactly. Poker chips really is the smartest solution to it, to be completely honest. Except poker chips are larger than quarters. So it's kind. Of, you're kind of not supposed to use those based on what they've said. Uh, from what you've seen so far, you feel like Daggerheart is a little easier to pick up and build a character you already have in mind or copy from another game or media than something like 5e. I think that's that might be true. It depends on it depends a lot on the character you have in mind, of course. But I think that because I, it does seem like this is a looser system, I think that's probably true. Depending on the character you you have in mind, Insomniac. That's a really good point. Yeah, you have a ton of different tokens, but you've been gaming for more than thirty years. You know how how are everyone else? Exactly, Zach. Just track it with tallies. I'm kind of like. Could we just 
use hash marks, right? Why does it have to be that? Um, or print ones to design your own as well, right? Exactly. <clears throat> yeah, that's true. You can stack poker chips, which would help. Reference section, character sheets and guides, blah, 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 blah. Recommend paper and writing utensils or a digital equivalent for notes. So why aren't we using paper and writing equivalents for the, the tokens? I don't know. I, just, I don't know. Well, that's the thing. I mean, Singularity, that's a really good point, is if Daggerheart takes off, which it almost certainly will at least to some degree, Etsy's going to have, a, as you say, a field day making customized tracking tokens. Like, there will be a third-party market for this one way or another, and that's not... That's not a bad thing. That might be enough of a virtue, but it is still just a, it's a, it's a question as well of like, do you want this to play the game or do you need this to play the game? And that's where I start to get a little iffy about that mechanic because I can go to Etsy. I have gone to Etsy and bought healing potions with four little, you know, with the 2D4s in them for healing potions. I don't have to. So that's where I'm worried. That's what I'm worried about with this mechanic. Again, I am by far not the first person to make that observation. We'll see what happens. Maps and miniatures are optional. And it does seem like they really are optional here, unlike in the MCDM RPG, where they are really um, building it much more around that. And that is also interesting to me as well, is that from what I understand, the MCDM RPG has leaned into a lot of 4th edition's mechanics. And that means they're trying to go for a much more gridded approach to the game. It means that you have, um, you measure things in grid spaces and, you know, spaces moved rather than in feet or inches. Uh, it means that you also have a very different approach to monsters, which we have definitely seen in Flea Mortals, which is very 4th edition and similar. This game is taking the other aspects of 4th edition, which is you have cards based on your powers. And what they do have, I think they have fixed a problem that 4th edition had. No, oh, pardon me. I think this game has taken the opposite lesson of 4th edition and said, like, okay, what about the cards? What if we do that part of 4th edition? But they've fixed the problem, which was, in 4th edition, you had way too many cards and you couldn't keep track of them all, which is why you only have five in Daggerheart at any given time. But I remember that also being something people didn't like about 4th edition. And I'm wondering, has the world changed enough that it will work better? And also, is it just a different product, right? I mean, the problem with 4th edition fundamentally was that it was called Dungeons and Dragons. If it had been called Daggerheart, people might have been more into it. It had some problems still, it had some issues still. But the fact that you now have digital tools might mean that you have a better way to handle a lot of the stuff the fourth edition was struggling with, and Daggerheart might be trying to capitalize on this. Yeah, Daggerheart I said Daggerheart right this time. Daggerheart might be capitalizing on the fact that the culture has changed enough that maybe we are willing to deal with cards. But also, that is just how they play, right? That is definitionally, like, fundamentally, the folks at Critical Role, they use D&D Beyond now, but during Campaign 1, they had all the spell cards for D&D. And so for them, I don't think having all the bits is a barrier to entry. They like having wormwood boxes that they roll their dice in. They like having dice jails. They like the ephemera. They or not not the ephemera, the opposite of ephemera. They like all the tactical stuff. That, and then Zach, that's a good point. Our fourth edition's powers, you know, your argument is they were less distinct than Daggerheart's domain cards. I think it may depend on the specific examples, but there's definitely an argument uh in terms of because they gave you so many more options in fourth edition, I think that is probably true. Whereas with Daggerheart, it seems like you have a lot fewer options at each level up, which I don't love, but I also think does help solve the 4th edition problem. It's going to be interesting. Um, all ages, races, ethnicities, gender, sexual orientations, religions, and identities. Good. Yes. <laughs> Agreed. Possible to touch on subjects that are difficult or sensitive for some players. No part of the fiction should ever take priority over the health and well-being of any player. Yes, good. Um, could bring up a real-life topic, very sensitive or uncomfortable for someone else. Yes, true. Make sure you all talk through what kind of experience you're looking to have. Bring up any themes or topics you're looking to avoid. All players at this table abide by the social contract. Feel free to add to a modifier at any time. Lines and veils. Okay, good. We have rules about lines and veils. They're a living document. 
X card. They're just putting the X card in their game. Cool. <clears throat> the Maui, that is definitely something I'm I'm wondering about is are you gonna have as much fun with the wizard in Daggerheart? I don't know, I don't know, you know? We'll find out. And that's the risk with a lot of these. Like But also, you have a uh only ten levels to fill, which does help. I do think that's interesting too. What is it? The MCD MRPG, Daggerheart, Shadow Dark, all of them have gone with only ten levels. Um Little Hill Comics, I see what you're saying, that it's a bummer that it's not assumed as the default. Unfortunately, as the cast of Critical Role can tell you, sometimes the player is just a jerk, and it does help to put it in writing early on. Um, because you kind of need to make sure that it's it's stated. They've been through that already. <clears throat> okay. Preparing for adventure, playing an adventurer, running an adventure, running a campaign, customizing your game. Okay, I like that arrangement. I, we'll see if everything lands in the right sections, but I like that breakdown of categories. Think about character concepts. Get a sheet and guide. Record your level. Okay. I think the, I think the classes and subclasses they chose is really interesting because so many of them reflect things they've done in their own games. Because some of these are, okay, you're going to have a guardian or some version of that and a warrior in any fantasy RPG, right? People want to fight. It seems like the warrior is more about taking down specific adversaries or Call of the Brave is you take lots of hits and get power from being surrounded by them. Whereas the guardian is more about either you're the tank or you're protecting other people. So this would be more like the paladin being a protection fighter or sorry, the paladins are protection fighters. And this is more like the barbarian. The warrior is another way to get, this could either be a, this could kind of be like a barbarian as well. Um, or this is more like a ga character that I played in the game, mortals descend of the gods, which you can't find now, which is a shame because I helped write it. And my favorite character was Heimdall where the more damage he had taken, the more damage he did. That's kind of, I wonder if that's what that is here. So some of these are like, okay, you're going to have that for sure. Like you're always going to have a wizard because people want to play Merlin. People want to play Gandalf. And then I'm interested to see, okay, how do the other classes they chose fit in? Like, I think it's fascinating that we have had at least, have we had a cleric in every Critical Role campaign? I don't know if we have, but we have a, had a lot of them. We don't quite have the oh i'm selecting the wrong one we don't quite have the cleric as we know it we have someone who flies and attacks from the sky and we have like a more of a thor type it seems like and i'll i'll, I'll see more of these when we actually check them out that's really interesting we don't have the traditional cleric like in the back healing but that's because i think the sorcerer and the wizard can heal in this game is my understanding so that's where that core fantasy went. Because the dividing line isn't the different types of magic, it's the different play styles. I think it's fascinating that the bard made it into this. It's not surprising, Scanlan's a, a very popular character and that he did some great stuff. It's just really interesting. We have both the wordsmith and the troubadour. We have two different types of bard and we don't have any actual like clerics as we might know them well, yeah, I mean, the the Seraph is both a cleric and a paladin, really. It's just really interesting to me. And, of course, we get the druid, which makes perfect sense. What is this? This is the healing. Okay, so we have another healing with the druid. And then this is more the nature. Okay, so this is more the cleric, and this is more, like, the keyleth. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> Warden of the Elements also being very interesting with that. Um, It's also really funny to me that we get a ranger. Because... You know, Vex struggled a bit playing the ranger because of the f way the 5th edition ranger worked. But it was still important enough to them that they made sure to put it in their own game. Because, hey, if you want to play trinkets, or tr play someone who has trinkets, you can. And this is... And, of course, we get two different kinds of rogues, because rogues are very popular. They've had a few rogues on Critical Role as well. 
you want to use the cover of shadow to maneuver through your environment, or if you want to have useful contacts everywhere you go. That's interesting. I just think it's really interesting to see which classes made it into their game. Because we don't quite have... Like, I know one of the things that, that I miss the most from 4th Edition, I think that most people who played 4th Edition miss, is the Warlord. Because the Warlord was a lot like a cleric, but he had no magic. Right? It was all just tactics. Kind of like a bard, but more so kind of like a battle master. But it was really like, hey, I can, like, run across the field, and every person who hits me... I then can transmit more healing to the person I'm I'm healing. So there's a very deliberate, you know, the Warlord was cool. It doesn't make it into everyone's game. You know, we don't quite have that here. Um, oh, maybe Call of the Brave. We'll see. Uh, now, that's a good point. Little, little Hill Comics. Do they want to do a Ranger to show Wizards of the Coast how it's done? I mean, I think even the Ranger Wizards of the Coast has gotten better, but... <clears throat> Yeah, so it's something Malzian. It's it's interesting. It's interesting why they went with Seraph for the for the healer. It's very interesting to me. Hmm. But it makes sense though, right? Oh, I'm so dumb. You know why this is here, right? You know why they have the winged sentinel. Because of Pike. Because of that moment in the Briarwood arc where. Pike jumped off the ledge and Matt described her as having wings. And then ever since then you had wings as being associated with Pike, even though she usually didn't have them. That was like, she's an angel. She's a, you know, that, that became so tied to her identity. And also I'm not going to spoil it in case, um, mega is still in the chat, but we will have other religious characters with wings later down the line in, in other campaigns or in that campaign. I'm not going to say that's why this is here. Because of those characters. Okay. That makes sense. And I think that's really interesting. Yeah, AKL, that's the other thing about cards is they can absolutely do booster decks and do more expansion packs and release other subclasses. And they can pace it out in a way that makes sense for them. Which, again, is just merch, right? Just a smart way to do it. Again, with Ancestries, I think we see the same thing. You know, Clank, Warforged, we have one of those in Critical Role. Fawn. We have one of those in Critical Role. Halfling. We have no gnomes. So this is the only version... Pardon me. We have no gnomes in this game. So this is how they're getting Pike and Scanlan, right? Because you don't really need the, both the halfling and the gnome. Really. I'm kind of surprised they didn't go with only gnome because gnomes are more from folklore than halflings are. But, you know, makes sense. Damon, that's your tieflings. We've definitely had those in Critical Role. This one looks like one specifically, actually, now that I think of it. I don't think that's an accident. The Furbolg is really interesting to me. Because the Furbolg famously kind of got um, reimagined because of a very funny incident that happened on Critical Role. Which was, Matt described the Furbolg. And Furbolgs in 5th edition, in the art, are just giants with kind of like bigger noses. And Matt was describing it and kind of described the characters being vaguely cow-like. And Liam misheard it and referenced horns. And ever since then, Furbolgs have just been cow people. In the Critical Role fandom especially. And it has been ubiquitous enough that they just said in this version, they resemble cows in a humanoid form. This is their version of Furbolg. And you know what? Good for them. Good for them for getting to do their version of Furbolgs that they kind of accidentally brought into existence um, through complete accident and happenstance and through fan art. Um, Gretchen, thanks so much. I'm I'm happy to. This is very exciting. Um, yeah, Mackie, you're right. He said bovine. And sort of from there, it became this, this whole adjacent um, approach to the completely different interpretation visually that really took off with the audience and um yeah good for them human you know you have to have those as well yeah so that's the thing furbolg i saw this in the material i was like oh furbolg must be something other than wizards of the coast exclusive and sure enough they are from uh irish folklore as you say uh although it doesn't seem like they're anything like irish folklore okay good to know humans what is their ability when you fail a role that utilize one of your experiences you may spend a hope to reroll that's pretty good Perseverance, yep. 
Dracona. Very funny to me that they have such a link here to Draconia, given all the context uh, around that land and that character. But, you know, again, you want to be make sure that people can take their characters and drop them directly into Daggerheart. So you got to have a Draconian. And, you know, they've had a bunch of... They've had some Dragonborn on the show before, besides just Tiberius. So, like, why not include the Draconia? Dracona, sorry. I'm a, you know, I think we're all going to do that. Fungril, that's really funny to me that they included this one. And I don't hate it, by the way. I like the Fungril, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. Katari, I think a lot of people very reasonably see this and they go, oh, I see, they're kind of playing off of Skyrim. And you know what? They probably are. Like, obviously there are Tabaxi in Critical Role, but, like, this is kind of more for the people who have played Skyrim. Dwarf. When you take physical damage, you spend three hope. Wow, three hope to only take half the damage instead. Okay, you must get a lot of hope then. Interesting. Galapa. I do think it's strange that Galapa... I think this is maybe something Bob Worldbuilder talked about, which is... It's strange that Galapa is named after um, a place in our world. Like, there's they, they, that's why they call it a Galapa, right? Because we think of the Galapagos Islands, which thinks of giant turtles. So it's, it's evocative, even though it makes no sense. But you know what? Take it where you can get it. <laughs> like, it doesn't really matter why it's evocative. Like, it kind of only matters that it's evocative. Um, orc? Okay, no half-orc, just orc. Uh, square features and boar like tusks. When you should mark an armor slot, roll a d6. On a 5 plus, you don't mark the armor slot, but still reduce the incoming damage by your armor score. Ooh, okay, that's cool. <clears throat> so it's not, you don't have to spend anything on that. You just, it's just a chance of failure. Okay. The elf. During a long rest, you may choose to drop into a celestial chance. When you do, drop a number of, roll a number of d8 equal to the stress you have marked and clear all stress. If any of these dice have a matching value, also clear all hit points. Oh, wow. That's powerful. But there's also a chance of failure, I guess. Interesting. So how does he... I'm going to be curious how healing works when we get to the long rest. Um, Giants. I think it's really funny that Giant is in here instead of something like a Goliath. But that's really funny. But again, oh, you know, we didn't talk about it. Of course, we have a Turtle Man... Because there's one of those in Critical Role. Of course we have a giant, because we have Grog. One to three eyes. That's appropriate. That makes sense. Ribbits. I mean, come on. Look, they struck gold. We all know it. <clears throat> this guy's going to be in every thumbnail for Daggerheart for the next year and a half. We all know it. Uh, fairy. Yeah, somebody somebody said to make make sure to take a look at them. Oh, interesting. And the fairies are the only ones with two powers. No, I'm sorry. The ribbit does too. Oh, and the giant does as well. Okay, so I'm just a liar. <laughs> um, those are the only two that we've seen so far that do. I think so. Oh, halfling has little lucky. Give everyone your party hope. Interesting. Fairy. Mark stress to take flight until you next roll with fear. While flying, your evasion score increases by two. Once per session after you and an ally in close range make an attack roll, you can mark a stress to allow reroll of the duality dice. Yeah, so, I, and I've seen this, they are more like insect people, so there's a lot more variation there for what kind of insect you evoke. Interesting. You could be a bumblebee person if you wanted to. More Fern Gully-esque, I guess. No, not really. Danger sense. Mark a stress to make the GM reroll an attack against you. That's fun. But of course we have a goblin because we've had a goblin in critical role. Simia. Simia is really funny that they included this too. This one... Oh. What? Huh. Okay. Seems like there's a, uh, an issue there. Um, but it, that one does also kind of feel like, hey, um, we are going to show Wizards of the Coast how it's done when it comes to the Simia. Okay. Let me take a look at the card for the Simia. Because I should have that downloaded. <laughs> Where? Another action campaign. You're there. Mm, fungal. 
Angel, Furball, Olu. Did I miss him? What order are these in? Oh, there they are. Simia. Take advantage on ability rolls that involve balancing and climbing and add plus one to your evasion. Sure. Okay. Makes sense. Oh, interesting. Steven, you say you think all of the not D&D games coming out of this round of them have frog people. Is that true? Interesting. Um, but this is the thing that is really interesting to me is that the ribbits, the fungrel, the Katari, the Galapa, the fairy, this is much more fairy tale adjacent fantasy. Even the Simia as well. Uh, I don't need to hover over it. The Fawn, the Furbolg. Like, it's much less what we think of as D&D &D and much more what we think of as something like Redwall, which is why I'm so surprised that the list of influences didn't include anything with any sort of whimsy in it. Um, it's interesting. I like it. I mean, I like that they're offering that option. I think that's cool and helps kind of make the world a little more distinct and unique. Um Oh, yeah, yeah, what was it? Fungral. Always connected. To speak with other Fungral across distances uh, to access their hive mind of information, make an instinct roll. At character creation, describe what ritual you must perform to tap into this connection. Which makes sense, right? And someone in the comments said this is kind of like The Last of Us. And, you know, given the roles that some of the people in Critical Role have had, it seems like they are, were also thinking of The Last of Us. Um, yeah, there's no Aarakocra or SMR. No bird people. Yeah, that is interesting. Ooh, Dan, that's a good way to put it, Dan. -N. Moving away from Tolkien and towards C.S. Lewis. Yeah, a little bit. Interesting. Choose your community. Highborn. Which is just nobles. Ridgeborn. From, like, rocky cliffs. Okay. Underborn. From suburban society. Okay. Loreborn, which is academic. Seaborn, which is seaside, which makes sense. Wanderborn, nomadic. Okay. Orderborn. Ooh, I opened two at once. How did that happen? Orderborn. Oh, okay, so these are more like you grew up in a temple. Okay, makes sense. Doesn't have to be, but it can be. Slyborn, which is criminals, and wildborn, which is more wilderness. Okay, I like these categories. I think they're they're vague enough and applicable enough that they can help give you a sense of how open-ended some of the things that you're gonna create later for your character should really be. And that's smart. I think that's a I think that's a good way to handle it. Rather than say, oh, you're a bounty hunter, oh, you are a Acolyte. You know, it's a lot more open than that. I think that's smart. Everyone assumes a common language. It's up to you whether that's through mundane or magical means. That's fine. That makes sense. And sign language is widely understood across cultures and communities. If you'd like to have a specific regional language in your campaign, talk about it with your table. Yeah, makes sense. <clears throat> Interesting. So right now they say there are no languages. But if you want some, figure it out. <laughs> Which, okay. Fair enough, I guess. Um, okay, these are the six, and I'm really interested about these because I think this is really clever and kind of fascinating. So ordinarily, we have strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. And some of these are very similar, and some of these are just different enough to be really interesting. So we have no constitution this time around. Nothing like it. Dexterity has been split into two. Agility and finesse and that's really interesting to me i don't know for sure i mean you know six is always kind of arbitrary um it could be five it could be four it could be 12 like you can always keep going indefinitely right it could just be body mind and soul and you'd be fine with that if you wanted to but instead we have six and they just kind of take their own approach to it so for example wisdom is now instinct which i think is smart presence instead of charisma and my favorite change and by the way, this is all subjective. I don't even know really how I feel about the change in this one. So let's read through it, actually. Let me finish. I'll finish my thought in a minute. Agility is a high agility score means you're faster on your feet, nimbler and difficult terrain, and quicker to react to danger. You roll with agility to scurry up a rope quicker, sprint to cover, or bound from rooftop to rooftop. Okay. But then finesse is 
dexterous, and accurate. Roll with finesse for tasks that require fine motor control, being precise, careful, and quiet, like using fine tools, escaping notice, or striking with exact aim. I don't have any strong feelings about these being two different things or not. I don't really see what the appeal is of splitting it up, but it's fine. Like, I don't care, really. Um, I guess, yeah, it depends. I don't, I don't hate it because the ability scores are not going to be as extreme a difference as we get in 5e, and we'll get that later, which is the, the modifiers, but, um, which, I'll talk about that in a minute, um, but I think that, you know, if you're going to split them up, this makes sense. Strength, we know what it looks like. Instinct, you have a surrounding, a uh, 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 sense of your surroundings and a natural intuition. You roll with instinct to sense danger and notice details in the world around you or track an elusive foe. So it's really focusing more on the perception side of wisdom, which I don't hate. It's more on perception and survival. Presence is strong force of personality and facility with social situations to plead your case, intimidate a foe, or get all eyes on you. We don't have an insight equivalent here. Not really. Which is so fascinating considering how often the cast of Critical Role is quick to say, insight check. Like, you could say it's instinct. I would actually instead say, if you want to do insight roles really well, you need to come up with that experience. right? Like, write that experience on your sheet. But they also kind of said, hey, we're not including an insight feature. Um, you could call it presence. You could call it instinct. You could call it knowledge, right? This is analyze. It could work for that as well. This is my favorite change. A high knowledge score means you know information others don't and understand how to apply your mind through deduction and inference. You roll with knowledge to interpret facts, see the patterns clearly, or remember important information. Knowledge is not intelligence. And this is something that I have been really trying to push on my players recently when I've had players going, oh, I guess I'm just dumb. Look at my intelligence score. And I'm like, that doesn't have to be the case. Knowledge is not intelligence. And I think that's a really smart change to say, it's not about how smart you are. It's about what you happen to know. I've had players before also be like, I think my character is dumb, but I have this really high intelligence score. But I want to play someone who's sheltered and naive and dumb. And I was like, well, we, what we landed on is that he has a lot of book learning, but he's just still oblivious and naive and, you know, kind of the opposite of the problem that we were just talking about. Now, technically speaking, you're not going to wind up with Grog this way. You're not going to have, I mean, you can, but Grog could also have a plus two in intelligence or a minus one, like, because it's not intelligence anymore. It's knowledge. I think that is a really smart change that helps cut down on something that I have seen come up so many times recently at my tables. And it is funny because they're kind of sacrificing one of their most famous expressions from the from one of the earliest episodes, which we'll also see when we distribute their modifiers, which is minus one, is the worst someone can be at something. Where Grog was a minus two. We used to have, I have an intelligence of six, I know what I'm doing, which was funny because he had a minus two to everything. You can't technically create someone as dumb as Grog and you don't necessarily have an ability score that makes someone that dumb. And I actually think that's a good thing. This is something that I'm going to talk about in a future video. I don't know when. But at some point, we're going to have this exact conversation, right? Just because you have an ability score in a certain thing does not mean that you are dumb. Doesn't mean that you are whatever. Um, but they've helped get around some of that by just saying, look, it's not that you have no wisdom at all. It's that you just don't have very good instincts. It's not that you have no charisma. You just don't have the presence you need. And especially, it's not that you're dumb. It's that you don't know something. And you know what? In this world, we could all be reminded a little bit more often that not knowing something doesn't make you dumb. I really like this change. It doesn't mean that everyone needs to change to it, but I do like the change. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to get off my soap box and sit. Um, I don't know that you need to call these modifiers because modifiers is a term when it was derived from a score, but then again, it is going to still modify your roles, so it does still work. Yeah, Mackie, exactly. It's that they leave it to a role-playing choice instead of feeling like you should be that. Exactly. Okay, evasion. <clears throat> So evasion is how hard you are to hit, 
And then you have armor, which helps absorb damage, and then hit points and stress, which are the different ways you take damage. I don't have a strong feeling about any of that yet. I'm going to see how I feel when I play through it. Because that's a mechanic that I definitely want to see in action before I know how it feels. Rolling with hope versus rolling with fear. We've talked a lot about that earlier. Okay, maximum of five. And the GM keeps track of fear. Doesn't have a limit. Okay. Starting equipment. Choose your weapons. Physical weapons or magic weapons. So obviously, we're going to have a different approach to magic in this game, which is fine. Primary weapon and secondary weapon. Yeah, because already I remember seeing in the Critical Role Session Zero when Liam was said, it says here I can take a magic weapon, so is that cool? And Matt was like, yeah. And he was like, okay, I have a magic weapon at level one? And he was like, yeah. I think this is maybe something that could be a little clearer. Maybe we'll see how I feel when I get to it. Maybe just Liam didn't have that in front of him at the moment. He was probably just seeing something on his sheet that said magic weapons. And he was like, uh, okay, that's good to know that I can someday use those. But um, I think this is going to change how magic weapons and physical weapons work in this game, which is a good thing because th that means they're going to have their own approach. Okay. One second. I have to be done by four. So I don't think we're going to make a character today, which is fine. That helps take some of the pressure off. I'll probably try to do a live stream Monday or Tuesday. I have to be done by four. I probably will finish a little bit earlier. Um, oh, I have a new subscriber. Necroharmonixer. Awesome. Thank you. Welcome. And Strahd's Handler. I hope, I, I hope these people are in chat. I have a new follower on Twitch, Peak Tundra. And the Mui was a new subscriber. I didn't realize that either. Hello. Welcome, folks. Oh, wow. The Mui, you're a Prime subscriber. I have not been looking at the mini feed at all. Welcome, folks. Oh, okay, Patina. It, a po po poet in a box. It seems like most magic weapons are as good or worse as physical weapons. They just have range. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, something well seen. It is, it is because you're coming from D&D &D that we have these assumptions, for sure. Right, just deals magic damage instead of physical damage, which is totally fine. Um, okay, armor, we'll talk about later. We'll talk about once I've played it. Uh, oh, never mind. I'll have to look at that later. What's well, an insight check equivalent that will still fall under instinct? Yeah, that's where I'm leaning as well, Alexandra. Is I think that I would call that the insight equivalent. I just I like that they haven't included that. I think it's especially interesting that they haven't included it, given how often they jump to insight checks in their games. And they may be very consciously trying to steer away from that. I still wouldn't mind them including some reference to it to know where it goes, even if they just say, hey, we're kind of trying to cut down on insight checks or, or do this instead. You know, we'll see. Some way to reference it without making it as uh, oversimplified as it is in 5e would probably be good. Other starting items. Torch, 50 feet of rope, basic supplies. I kind of wish basic supplies was a little bit more like survival gear or something, something a little bit more descriptive than that. Cause I think this is a little bit too easily abused, but we'll see. We'll see how people feel about that. Especially when people are actually creating their characters and, and playing with that and saying, Hey, um, this is my basic supplies, right? Uh, something Wellsian, uh, glad you were able to be here. Little Hill, the fans love whispers. What the fans love does not necessarily mean that it's good game design. The problem with whispers, I like whispers, and I've used them in my games, and sometimes I use some equivalents in my digital games. The actual root of the problem with whispers is that it does not solve the metagaming problem. It works around it. If you tell your players, hey, you know this and you don't, the players just have to not metagame. If you walk up to someone and whisper something in their ear, you're not giving them the option to not metagame. 
I like whispers as a, as a as a show feature, and I like using them occasionally in my games. But they are just kind of saying, "Listen, I'm not going to try to teach you not to meta game. I'm just going to avoid. I'm just going to let you know something is happening. You can figure out what you want to do about it." I don't. I have complicated feelings about it. Yeah, Alexandra, Matt's tried so often to get his players to say, "Do I believe them?" and failed. He could not get his players not to say inside check. This may be the way to solve it. There aren't they aren't in the game. <laughs> Which again, I have no problem with. Fair enough. Uh handful of gold is very funny. That handfuls are the um uh, uh the system here. I think it's funny that it's still a gold system game. Cuz Pathfinder is a silver standard. Interesting. A minor health potion. And minor stamina potion. So already again, we have um, magic being more common, which again is fine. It definitely fits with a world like Taldori, you know, because Taldori more so than the rest of Alexandria. Taldori is very magic heavy. So someone starting at level one with a, a potion makes sense. Oh, and someone also mentioned the armor is kind of like Dark Souls. I can't speak to that, but isn't this a little bit like Dark Souls too? You start with a potion. The and either option to your player guide is explicit to your class. Oh, oh, I see. This is a strange way to phrase this. I see what they're saying. That's a strange way to phrase it. Mm -hmm. Create your background. Oh, so this is the questions. Okay, fair enough. Not a ton. To oh, this is the thing I do like about this, though, is that it's... How do I phrase this? implicitly the emphasis is a little bit more on rather than giving you a background it's giving you questions you answer to come up with your background i wish there were more questions than just the ones that you get this is the same thing that happens in a lot of of um powered by the apocalypse games though you know both masks and uh dungeon world and i think maybe monster of the week have like sections you fill in and it's like okay there's only so many options which is why you really do have the option to say ignore these, come up with your own. But a lot of the character creation stuff is very heavily inspired by Power of the Apocalypse, which is fine. I'm just going to be curious to see if they add more options later or how that works. Tracker, I, I am going to watch their Daggerheart one-shot. I just, I don't know that I want to until I make my character I, because I think that's going to influence my decision too much because I'm very subjective or suggestible. Yeah, Brian, that is kind of the concern I have as well. I don't, I've never loved it, and I've seen it before many times. I've never loved systems that are like, we're just going to abstract the amount of gold. I'm like, uh, oh, okay, I guess. Like, it's just kind of saying, hey, you can spend money at the bar. Um, we're not going to worry about it. If you're gonna, going out for a night of drinking, it will cost one handful of gold. If you are just, um, Staying at the tavern for a week, that is a handful of gold. It's abstraction, and abstraction is smart game design. It's just not... I don't love it, but it's it's kind of a necessity sometimes. Um, we'll see. We'll see how we feel. I, it is there because encumbrance is so often not fun. And I agree with that. I think that encumbrance is probably easier with digital tools. But even so, like people don't like that amount of bookkeeping. right? We're kind of not in that era of gaming anymore. So, like, this handful of gold would not be how it worked 10 years ago. But it is now. And I think that that is very of its time, and especially it's very reminiscent of the um, the influences of this on this game from things like Powered by the Apocalypse that are more rules light. We'll have to see if that's how people feel about it, you know? <clears throat> we have to We have to let them know if it actually works in the game. Because I can have all the opinions I want about that. doesn't matter until I actually see how I feel about the game. I think experience is a confusing name for this uh, because experience feels like leveling up. It's a reference. But um, we'll see. We'll see how people actually feel. Mark Miller, thank you so much. Pair character jumping in the, punching in the air with fist and bump written on his knuckles. 
Is that that from the uh, the sheet? Is what we're saying. I'm not sure I understand, uh, Mark Miller. Like you're describing it as like that's how the character would be described. Um, I'm just reading. I'm just reading all your chats. Yeah, I mean, Alexander is definitely they're less currency focused, and yeah, it is kind of a way to avoid Vex's hoarding. Kind of. Yeah, maybe. That is interesting. Again, it's like. What are the things you're trying to avoid in your game? Um, you just sort of hand wave them, you know, which is what they're trying to do with some things. Yeah, it is kind of like, did you not like it when Vex was nickel and diming and, and tracking every coin? Then don't worry about that stuff. Oh, it's a sticker. It's an animated sticker. Oh, you know what? <laughs> I'm on the wrong chat. If I look here, oh, on the YouTube chat bar for me, it shows us the sticker. On the multi-stream, it doesn't. Oh, well, cool. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> oh. That was a senior moment, if I've ever had one. Waka waka. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Don't look at me. <laughs> um, I, don't, I think experience is a confusing name for this. But I like this feature. I like that it says talented and focused are too broad swashbuckler and magic studies are more interesting take flight one hit kill or two mechanically oriented consider acrobatics or assassin which is kind of another way for them to incorporate things like different kinds of subclasses you know which is going to be interesting yeah experience is also the term they use for bonuses you gain from leveling up yeah they got to re they got to rename this then it's a bad like, this should maybe be called Focuses, or something like that. You know, that's an old um, it's an old piece of advice in anything creative is anybody's concern is valid, anybody's suggestion is bunk. Like, I can come up with a thousand names for this. It doesn't mean they're going to use them or should use them, you know. Oh, Mark, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Experiences and remind me of aspects and fate. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, aspects would work as well. Um, or... Yeah, that's kind of interesting. I just, I don't, I think that's a really confusing term. <clears throat> Experience examples are backgrounds, specializations, skills, phrases. I, even, even, if, even if we take out the leveling side of things... I don't think experience is the right term for this, right? I don't know what it is, though. Like, features or traits or something like that is closer. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think that just needs to be renamed. I like the system, though. I think this is a really smart approach, especially giving you a good list. Bodyguard, con artist, merchant, noble, pirate, scholar, thief. How many of those sound like backgrounds that we've had? Well, cool. You know, that helps. Magical historian, navigator, sharpshooter, swashbuckler, map maker. Some of these sound like backgrounds. Some of these sound like feats. And isn't that kind of helpful, right? Barter, repair, tracking, quick hands, incredible strength. These also sound like skills or, or um, proficiencies. Chef to the royal family. I won't let you down. Street doctor. This is not a negotiation. I'll catch you. Um, these are these are cool. I like these a lot. I just don't like this word. <laughs> Things I want to be good at. Exactly. Expertise is good too. Mark Miller, thank you again. I see the sticker this time. I'm looking at the right page. Good job. <laughs> thank you so much, Mark. Right. Something vague like keys. Well, or even can you lean more into like the actor or writer side of things? Can it be something like, um, you know, subtext? Like, there's, you know, what what can you do that's actually more and more interesting? Again, I don't care what they actually call it. I just think this is confusing. It's the same thing as like spell levels versus class levels. We run into that problem all the time in Five E. This is just another way to have the same problem. In a standard battle focused campaign. Take something helps with combat, and the second is outside combat. Um, interesting. 
that's good advice. I, I, I think the word standard battle focused campaign is doing a lot of heavy lifting there. Call it your resume. <laughs> Have they called anything daggers or hearts yet? No, I don't think so. Interesting. Um, yeah, this is doing a lot of heavy lifting. There's a lot of assumptions in calling in saying there's a standard battle focused campaign, but I think they're not wrong. Like that is kind of what I think they're right that that's how people are going to be playing the game. I just think, do you know? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess that doesn't necessarily mean that you're running a game like Matt's. Yeah, interesting. I think I would rephrase this, right? The issue isn't standard battle focused. It's in a game that is more balanced between combat and exploration. Because if we're doing a dungeon crawl, then we don't really want something that will help in combat and something else outside of combat as much, right? You want something that has a little bit more um, specialization. So I don't know. I'm, I, I'm just I'm just being a fuddy-duddy about this phrase. I just don't think it's communicating anything really as effectively as it hopes it will. Um, this game is a dagger in Wizards of the Coast's heart. Oh, I thought the name, I think somebody referenced this first when, when the game was first announced. Dagger Heart is just like, oh, of course you call it Dagger Heart if you're expecting it, if you're modeling it after how Liam O'Brien plays, because he puts a dagger in your heart whenever he plays a game. Because this is exactly, and that's the thing, is Dagger Heart does evoke, like, oh, we're going for your heart. We're going for something emotional, but also combat and also that kind of stuff. It's, it works on those double meanings, um, just like Critical Role's title does. Because there have been so many scenes in the history of Critical Role that really linger on making you emotionally destroyed, Daggerheart does kind of evoke that. Using experiences, you spend a hope to add its modifier. That's good. Being able to only access it behind a resource, which kind of keeps you from just falling into the same gameplay loop for every turn, which is useful, having a resource that you're you're spending. Changing experiences. You're not stuck with the ones you've chosen. Uh, the way you're choosing, you're using it isn't a good fit for the group's collaborative story, or you might feel one of the choices you made doesn't match how you've come to understand your character. Um, adjust it as needed. Yeah, okay. Fair enough. Choose the domain cards. Domains are the building blocks. Ah, this is what I was looking for earlier. Domain. I couldn't remember what it was called. Arcana, Blade, Bone, Codex, Grace, Midnight, Sage, Splendor, and Valor. So this is where the chart is that shows how they're all linked. No? I don't remember. Shared domains. Every class shares its domains with at least one other class. Yeah, so I, I would not be surprised if they do, um, down the road, introduce another deck of cards that links some of the classes that aren't connected here. So Blade is between Guardian and Warrior. Sage is between Druid and Ranger. Uh, where is the... Where is the chart? I really wish I could see it. <clears throat> like the list of all of them. Eh. Maybe I am imagining that chart, or maybe somebody made it for the purposes of... Um illustration but it wasn't actually an official chart shoot yeah maybe maybe that chart isn't actually present I thought there was a, an image help me out if you know what I'm talking about that was a ring of all the domains and all the classes and it showed where they all connected to each other because that was a really helpful um, visualization for me. I don't see it, so I think we may have... Yeah. Maybe somebody just made it for a YouTube video. <laughs> and that's how... And I was assuming it was an actual illustration. Well, they really need to include one. Because man, oh man, that would help. 
Is it Bob Worldbuilder? I think it must be. I think that's who it must have been. Um, okay, this is something. Loadout and Vault. You can only have a maximum of five domain cards active at any time, along with your subclass, ancestry, and community cards. At lower levels, you won't have enough cards for this to be an issue. Once you reach level five and above, you'll need to choose which domain cards to keep in your loadout and which to store in your vault. Cards in your loadout can be held in your hand or placed at the table next to your character sheet. Do whatever it makes it easier to access them. Any cards in your loadout are considered active and can be utilized or benefited from in play. Your vault holds any domain cards that are inactive and not currently in your loadout. Vault cards should be kept somewhere out of the way, but close enough that they're available if they need to be accessed during a session. If you want to switch a card from your vault to your loadout, do so immediately by marking stress equal to that card's recall cost. When you do so, switch it for another domain card, placing the other into your vault. If adjusting your loadout during a short or long rest, you don't need to pay the recall cost. Similarly, if your loadout is full when you level up again and gain a new card, you can immediately move one of the previously active cards into your vault and add the new card to your current loadout at no cost. And if an effect tells you to place a card permanently in your vault, that card is essentially removed from play. You can't move a card back into your loadout by any means. Okay. Oh, is it in the Critical Role video? Oh, is it on the Critical Role Reddit? Ooh, maybe. I'll have to check that out in a minute. Um, okay, here's the thing. This is a terrific mechanic. Swapping cards from your vault because you want, want some new feature. And the fact that there's an icon in the cards... Um, Let's see if I have the cards here. Uh, no, they wouldn't be on these ones. They would be on... <laughs> these. This is like the cost of these cards. This is a really cool mechanic, and it sucks that you can't access it until level 5 of a 10-level game. Why are we using cards if you're not going to use card mechanics? What are we doing? Like, I love this and hate it. I love this mechanic and I hate that it's inaccessible for almost half the game. What are we doing? Use cards if you're going to use cards. If you don't use this for most of the time people are playing, then why are they cards? Just have people write things down in boxes. Save yourself a lot of stuff you have to print. I really think they need to make the cards more interesting more reasonable like justify the use of cards here why do you have to have cards can you why aren't why don't we just have one spare every level you know <clears throat> you always have one more than your level at most you would have access to 11 cards and you would have but even if that even if you don't keep gaining them that much but if it's just the first four levels you always have one spare in your vault that'd be fine with me you always have one more than your level up until whenever i don't know i don't know what the solution is but right now i don't see a reason for this to be a card-based game except once you get to level five Singularity, you're the other way. Not fond of, I can do so many things, I forget some of them and have to strain to remember. It's not that you strain to remember them. I mean, I cer certainly I suppose it's a possibility. It's it's more like prepared spells. I mean, I get it. That's reasonable. But this, to me, is part of the gameplay loop. <clears throat> like, if this is why... If their thing is, we wanted to make a game that has cards, I think they have to justify it. There's level up options to get more cards before level 5. I think they should have more from really early on. That's my feeling. That's where I'm on that. On that. Um. Because otherwise, I don't know why we have this many. Like, why we're using cards? It doesn't have to be. Where did I? Oh, I see, I see. So we're in the same section. Domains, yeah. So so that's part one. Part two. <clears throat> Jeff, yeah, cynically, it's to sell you cards. And that may not be the case, because they also want you to be able to print off cards. But, like, either add more cards or have people be able to access the cards more often that seems like 
that has been my biggest concern with this game. Again, we'll see how it feels in play, but like I, yeah, Little Hill, it's it's like making D and D with dice, but you don't have any mechanics for them until level ten. It's kind of like making mechanics with dice, but you only need D sixes until level eight. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm seeing people also argue, like, if you don't... People are also arguing that it cards should matter more for what the powers are. And I don't agree with that because that wasn't... Because, again, I come from 4th edition. In 4th edition, everything had a card. I don't mind that part of it. I just wish the cards were a bigger factor. But that's my only major nitpick with the cards right now. I, I think it is a major nitpick with that. But, like, I don't think that makes the game broken, necessarily. Knighthood? Uh, I'm liking it. Um, I, there's some things that I'm particularly weighing out on making a judgment about until I actually play the game, which I'm hoping to do soon. Um, probably in the next two weeks, I'm hoping. Cause it's going to be really hard to plan for anything in April when we've got a baby coming pretty soon. But, uh, yeah, exactly. I'm level nine. Finally, I can use a D8. That's kind of how it feels. Now, now that's tricky because in D&D, there are always some dice that nobody uses. You know, it's like you're not going to use all the dice, probably. The Barbarian's the only one that uses a D12, most likely. Rogues use D4s far more often. Like, it kind of depends. Yeah, so Singularity, that is the difference. You had lots of cards. You didn't have... You still had to choose cards, but you had lots of cards. So I think that they made a smart decision to not go as far as 4th edition did. You know, if if 4th edition is even an influence, I'm sure somebody at some point was like, hey, this is enough like 4th edition that we should check and see what they did and see where they got it wrong. If they didn't, they happened to arrive at a good place. But I think that, again, it's just kind of wasted opportunity right now. Uh, Clever, did I ever play 3.5? A little bit. I didn't understand it, while I was playing it, but my first character, my first two, technically three, but we'll say two characters were 3.5 characters. <clears throat> Maybe they can change so the loadout increases in size with the level and the max is five. So you already s toy with the swap mechanic at level two because your loadout is only two at this point. My, um, oh, Rowling, I was talking about like daggers, but that's a good point. Um, yeah, it depends on a lot. I mean, I'm generalizing. Um, I think the issue is I don't need to solve this problem because I'm not on the Daggerheart design team. All I need to say is, hey, right now, I don't understand why we're not using the cards more. It doesn't even need to be that much more. If we just have a vault from level one or two, I'm happy. Even if there's just one card in there, I'd be happy. I want to know how that plays. But, you know... I would not hate that version of the game. If we had, at any time during the game, one or two cards in your loadout, at least that's some choice. Now, not everyone likes having that much choice, but right now it's kind of like, at the first level, everybody is a fighter, and then at fifth level, everyone becomes a wizard. You have a little bit of stuff that you have chosen, but you can't prepare all of it at once. And that's just a strange... Um, that's a strange balance right now. Do I think 22 cards per domain will be enough for a full release? I don't know. Um, I have no idea. It's going to be fewer options for sure, but they're always you're always going to start with fewer options. Like, this is a game that's really easily added to, which is why it's more important to get the fundamental mechanics right, right now. Which I know is kind of a cop-out answer, but that's kind of how I feel about it right now. I don't really care, because in 4th edition... So, you asked about 4th edition... For this, and you chose like three or four things. Well, actually, I can answer that question right now. Let's find out. Let's see what we were working with back in 4E. So, first of all, each of these was a power. So, they, didn't, they weren't automatically cards, but it, it was helped a lot by putting them on cards. Um, mm 
you could choose. I think you got like two of each of these. I'm trying to remember. But talking about the options available. Level one ranger, there were four at wills you could choose, four encounter powers you could choose, and four daily powers you could choose. At level two, you had two utility, sorry, three utility powers you could choose. You could only pick one of those, and for you could pick one daily, one encounter, and maybe two at wills. So there were always like some you weren't taking, which is fine. This game didn't really need a vault. Maybe let me put it this way: this this game didn't have anything like a vault. It maybe should have, um, but it didn't. And instead, what happened was you just had a lot of things printed out. Because trying to keep track of this stuff without cards was really frustrating. And you, we didn't really have cards that you bought for this game. We just printed them out and cut them up. And that was the, the best way to keep track of it at the time. So my, my argument is definitely not that 4th Edition got it right as far as incorporating cards into the system. I just think that there is room for th this game is specifically a card game. Like that's that's incorporated far more into this. Um but I don't quite think they've nailed it yet. Is what I'll say. Do uh Drudenfuz, the uh 4E had a vault for wizards. That makes sense. That makes sense that they would have it with a spell book. Cuz that's kind of the vault is kind of the equivalent of a prepared caster that has a smaller selection, which is what like the, the 5e wizard is like. It doesn't surprise me that the 4e wizard was similar. Holly Mac, do you think the fear and hope dice will take away player agency? No, because I think from playing things like the Star Wars Edge of the Empire game and from playing Powered by the Apocalypse games, I think there's ways for you to work with the GM and find the best solution when you have a mixed success. That's what I could not come up with the term for earlier, but that's what it's called in Powered by the Apocalypse or a failure with a hope or a success with a fear. Um, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you literally feel fear or hope, but that's why I, you know, I've seen people speculate whether those are the right terms for that. I think they're fine. Um, but if your concern is, Hey, it feels like we're telling the players they need to feel hope or fear right now then that might be worth a submission to Darrington and say, hey, I don't think these are the right terms because it feels like you're telling the players how their characters are meant to feel. I don't get that impression, but if that's how you feel, then absolutely that's worth commenting on. But again, I'm coming from, I've played the Edge of the Empire. So I know what they're going for. I know what they're sort of, with the Genesis dice system, I know what they're referencing. So I didn't make that assumption going in. I don't know that all my players will feel the same way. Um, all right, my voice is definitely going. There's a couple things I want to talk about before we end the stream. Light, darkness. Yeah, there's. I mean, there's a lot of different um, connotations, uh, which, again, we don't necessarily have to solve the problem. We just have to sort of um, let them know where we're feeling like they're not quite lighting up. They're... You know, we can offer suggestions, but again, as we, as I said earlier, it is so much more important that we identify the problem than we tell them how to fix it. Because that's not our jobs. And our suggestions are going to be so much more limiting and narrow and specific than our identification of problems. Yeah, Holly, I definitely get that. I can definitely see how they got there. I didn't make that uh, assumption, but once you say it, I'm like, oh yeah, that is definitely something I'm going to have to keep an eye on as people play test it to see if they feel that way. You know? Okay, this is the gameplay loop. I'm just going to skim this and see if there's anything super relevant here. It doesn't seem super... Yeah, I mean, I think this is going to be the, the the standard stuff. Game has no turns in the traditional sense. GM moves. 
a lot of the stuff I'm going to have to reread and like figure out how I feel about it after I play test it. I don't have any strong feelings based on the initial read of them. We talked about the duality dice. We talked about hope and fear. We talked about critical successes using hope. Um, you can only hold up to five at a time. Help an ally. Spend a hope to help an ally. Oh, interesting. Okay. Spend a hope to use an experience. Can you give somebody a hope? Because I'm just imagining, what if somebody rolls crap all night? I wouldn't. I wouldn't mind spent giving someone a hope. <clears throat> yep, rolling with fear does not mean you failed. It just means there's a complication. We talked about that. Damage thresholds and hit points. Again, I don't really have strong feelings about. Um, about that right now. We'll see how I feel about damage. Stress. This is all part of hit points, which again, I'll, I'll talk more about after I've had a chance to play it. Set the difficulty. I wish this included a section about the DCs. I wouldn't hate that. Add extra dice and modifiers. Okay. Yeah, some of these I just won't be able to talk about until I play it. Counting character tokens. Uh, boy, there's a lot of adjudicating that happens before you add up your dice. Or before you roll your dice. Because you are building a pool of sorts. Could be interesting to see how that feels. But see, this is the thing I was thinking about. When you're talking about a game like Genesis RPG, which is the um, Warhammer Fantasy and Edge of the Empire... You don't have as many die rolls as you do with something like 5e, where 5e is much more a game of attrition and much more about resource management. This is more about the story moving forward rather than you get the null results. We'll see how that comes across. We'll see if they've nailed that. Like I said earlier, there's a reason why Powered by the Apocalypse games characters take damage based on their own failed roles, not based on what the GM does. So I'm going to be very curious to see how this lines up. <clears throat> okay, people are going nuts about stuff in chat. Uh, I got to reread. I got to read some of this. Um, you don't like the no turn thing. I think the shy person in the group gets overlooked. That is definitely a concern that I have because that happened a lot in our Edge of the Empire game and our um, I think part of the problem was that group, right? That was a very um, min-maxing kind of group, but like that's th that that is a style of play, and sometimes you play with people who are gonna want to be like, listen, it logically makes the most sense for me to be the first to act, and other people are gonna be like, okay, fine, just take it, and we would fall into routines we would, where it's always the same three people going first. I don't like it. I don't like it in most games. I'm going to be very curious how I feel about it when it, when I, we play some dagger hearts, but like, man, I know, I know there are people who don't like the 5e initiative. I think it's fine. I totally get people don't. They have different reasons for not liking it. Probably going to have to talk about more of those on the channel in the future. Fair enough, right? Fair enough. That is not everyone's favorite initiative system. I just, I really dislike, and, and, and many times, many people don't have a problem with it. Depends on your group. But I just don't like the, well, just whoever takes it, takes it. Because it's like, okay, after three sessions, we're going to find the rhythm. And it's always going to be the same people who sit. And like, even at least with Shadow Dark, it is honest with you. It's like, hey, listen, we're all rolling for initiative. Whoever acts first, we're just going to go clockwise from there. So you can decide the order by just deciding how you want to sit at the table. Okay, cool. If you want to talk strategy, let's figure out how we want to sit so that we know the wizard is acting after the fighter. Or what you know, whatever. But um, I just, I just don't like. And again, this is not. People don't have to agree with me. That's totally fine. I know people don't, but I just don't like systems where you choose who acts first because it's not even that people get overlooked. It's just that pushier people are going to go first. Hmm. 
You can you can spend a hope to give a nearby character advantage. Yes. Okay. So people are talking about that. The YouTube chat isn't popping up on screen for Twitch viewers. Ugh. Yeah, that's been happening. This is not the first time that's happened. For some reason, the on-screen chat will eventually just lose YouTube chat, which is annoying. I don't know why that happens. I'll try to at least get better about describing what I'm responding to. <laughs> yeah, min-maxing in the system will be interesting as damage is capped. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with this system for sure. We'll find out soon, I'm sure. A Little Hill comic says, with Power by the Apocalypse, no turns is a spotlight management issue. It usually turns out fine in my experience. It's absolutely a spotlight management issue. It's absolutely a player dynamic issue. But that is kind of something you have to factor in when you're designing a game. Like, the difference between Power by the Apocalypse games and something like D&D, &D, or arguably Shadow Dark, or Daggerheart, which is kind of try to blend the two of them, is that... Um, Power of the Apocalypse games are so specifically designed to push a specific narrative experience. Daggerheart is more open-ended, just like D&D is. It's not as open-ended as D&D. I think, I think Daggerheart probably has a clearer uh, goal for what it's going for, but it still kind of occupies some of the same space as D&D, &D, and I just think... I just think we're, I think we're going to wind up with more situations like what ran, I ran into with the Star Wars game, personally. But again, we're going to have to see what happens. <coughs> PDF recommends you can use the action tokens to keep active players from overshadowing silent ones. For example, you can only act again once every player is put in an action token once. Yeah, that would help. That would absolutely help. Um, and it's also a group size question sometimes. Um, but... <laughs> yeah, it's just, I mean, th this is an initiative system that's been bouncing around the hobby for like 10 or 15 years at this point. I'm just not wild about it because some people are going to, it's not even that someone's more forceful or pushy as, as cause, um, the crazy player says it's not even that it's just pushy people. Some people are just more forceful than others. I have to actively pull back to make sure I give other people space. Sure. I mean, I think we've all had that. I don't, shouldn't say we all, I've definitely had that problem before too. And the issue I have is that there's going to be times where it's like, listen, strategically, we should do this. And someone's going to be like, but wouldn't my character want to rush in? And you have different play styles butting up against each other. And I just, I just, I don't love it. Again, personal experience. It is what it is. We could always just roll a d20. <laughs> you know, we can always just come up with our own initiative system. Because people come up with their own initiative system for D&D, &D, right? It's not, it's hackable. If that's the initiative system they land on, it's not the end of the world. I just, um, I just don't like this approach to initiative in my groups. You know, and maybe I'll feel differently with different groups. I don't play with some of the pe people I used to play with, but like they still play games, you know, and they will. Pro they might play this one, and this could still happen. So, anyway, I am definitely losing my voice. I want to skip around a little bit and just get to the meat of the stuff I want to talk about. Again, I just don't have any strong feelings about a lot of this stuff until we actually play it. Reaction rolls. Interesting. Hmm. I don't know what that means. We'll have to see. Oh, oh, oh is it, are these like saving throws? Yeah, sort of like saving throws. Okay. Kind of confusing term, but okay. Evasion score. Okay. Ooh, pardon me. Advantage and disadvantage, which is just adding or adding a D6 or subtracting a D6. Fair enough. And that already tells us a lot about the balance, right? Already tells us they're going for something very different. It's also really funny because <clears throat> the folks at Critical Role briefly used inspiration in their games and then pretty quickly 
stopped using it. But even at the time, they were just giving people D6s because they didn't want to overshadow the bard. So their approach was, okay, instead of an advantage or a reroll, we're just going to give you a D6. And they dropped it really quickly. Like, I think by the time they were in Whitestone in episode 28 or whatever, I don't think they ever talked about inspiration ever again. Hidden, restrained, vulnerable. Okay. I, again, I don't feel any kind of way about any of those right now. Yeah, so I saw that this is like maps and movements and range is all very, very hand wavy right now, which is fine. Again, we'll see how we feel. And again, they have all the same unit of measurements that really D&D uses. So if you want to use those, you can. <clears throat> Gold, we talked about that. Okay, six handfuls are a bag, five bags are a chest, four chests are a hoard, three hoards are a fortune. Okay. Short rest is an hour. Two of the following options. That's a good balance. Ten to wounds, clear stress. Oh, you only clear a D4 of stress. You only patch a D4 of hit point. Oh, because it's a short rest. Okay. You can clear two armor slots. So you can repair armor much more reliably than you can heal or clear stress. That tells us a lot about the relationship with armor in the game. And describe how you're preparing for the path ahead and gain a hope. Okay. Okay. So at least players are guaranteed to get some kind of way of getting a hope as long as they short rest if they're having a really terrible night when it comes to their rolls. Okay. I feel a little bit better about that. Long rest. For a few hours and get some sleep. Okay. 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 Yeah, fine. I'm just thinking back. I mean, it's really funny to me. There are so many times in the Vox Machina campaign, especially where the the fact that rest is eight hours was so important and so clear. And it was like, and, and we're not going to get that in this version because, which is fine because they're going for a different experience because that was a limitation they were really struggling with many times, especially in the Vox Machina campaign. That's really funny and interesting. Hello, Zephy. How are you? No, you're fine. It's fine. Hello. Um. <laughs> Zephy, you're totally fine. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Tend to wounds. I didn't. I didn't announce this live stream, um, because I wasn't sure when I'd be able to go live. So, um, I did no problem at all for people not missing it. The VOD will be available on YouTube. And this is going to be at least one, probably a couple of future videos. So, all good. Ten to wounds. Describe how you patch yourself up, remove all marked hit points. Okay, so you heal all your hit points at, in a long rest again. Uh, clear all stress on a long rest. Then is the elf just worse? Because isn't the elf... Um, where during a long rest you may choose to drop into a celestial trance when you do roll a number of d8 equal to the stress you have marked and clear all stress if any of these dice has a matching value also clear hit points what Oh, because you can only do two things on a long rest. As So for one of your actions, you could potentially heal and clear stress. Okay. That's not as intense as I thought it was. But it's also not as broken, not as bad as I thought it was. <laughs> Yeah, the crazy player, it's true. It's really unlikely that somebody's hope die will always be lower than their fear die. I don't know. I just, you never know, right? Sometimes people just have bad days. Uh, Repair armor. Clear all the armor slots. Prepare. Gain a hope. If you prepare with one or more members of the party, you each take two hope. Ooh! I have talked so many times, and I'm going to talk about it again in a video that's coming out really soon. Um... 
I've talked so many times in this channel about how I love the scenes where the cast of Critical Role just talks about a plan. This is so good. This is such a smart way to gamify the fact that sometimes they just have to sit and talk and figure out what they want to do. And then everybody gets two hope? That's such smart design for that style of play. That's really good. That's really good. Even if it's just like, oh, I'm going to take armor from Vex and borrow her armor so I can have the acid um, reduction armor instead. Well, now we've both taken preparations for the day. So, you know, or at least I'm involving this other player. So now we both take two hope because I need this armor for the next day. It's so smart. Ooh, that's, oh, I like that more than you would expect. Um, work on a project. And again, that's more for like your Percy's, things like that, which is fair. Oh, interesting. Elf trance is an addition uh, to standard options. Seaborn background lets you do a third option per rest. So if you're a Seaborn elf, then one of your actions could be to clear stress and potentially hit points. And then you could still do two of these other things. That's cool. That's, that's pretty cool. Okay, there's some downtime rules. That's cool. Um, here we go. This is what I wanted to talk about a lot. Death. Once we talk about the death and scars and resurrection, we'll probably be done for the day. Because I'm feeling my voice go. Uh, I'm going to close this door. I'll be right back. Yeah, exactly. Uh, OC level three says a lot of the rules and mechanics highlight how the critical role crew play. Which a lot of the rules slash mechanics highlight how the critical role crew. A lot of the rules slash mechanics highlight how the CR crew play, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it absolutely does, and that's what I'm so fascinated by with this game, is when the design is reflecting how the game plays, or specifically trying to avoid things they've fallen into before. I think that's fascinating. Okay, let's talk about death. Choose one of the options below. Oh, so hang on. Facing death is an important part of being an adventurer, and having a character die can be an exciting end to a story and an opportunity for the player to transition into something new. In Daggerheart, you mark your last hit point. You must make a death move. Choose one of the following options below. Embrace death and go out in a blaze of glory. Take one action, at GM discretion, that's a smart inclusion, which becomes an automatic critical success, then cross through the veil of death. Avoid death and face the consequences. You drop unconscious temporarily and work with the GM to describe how the situation gets much worse because of it. Then roll your fear die. If its value is equal to or under your level, take a scar. You may not take any actions while unconscious. When you have any number of marked hit points cleared by an ally or on your party's next long rest, you'll return to consciousness. Risk it all, roll your duality dice. If hope is higher, you stay on your feet and clear an amount of hit points and or stress equal to the value of the hope die. Divide the hope die value up between the, uh, these however you'd prefer. If your, fear die is if your fear die is higher, you cross through the veil of death. If the duality dice are tied, you stay on your feet and clear all hit points and stress because it's a critical hit. <clears throat> if a player makes a death move that results in their character dying or no longer being able to play, they should work with the GM before the next session to build a new character at the current level of the rest of the party. Scars, you permanently cross out one of your hope slots. You cannot use the slot to store hope anymore. The narrative impact of the scar is up to you. For example, you may now bear a physical scar, a painful memory, or a deep fear. When you put a scar on your last hope slot, it's time to end your character's journey. Work with the GM to find a graceful and fitting way for your party to say goodbye to them at the end of the session and prepare a new character for the next time you play. That makes sense. It's possible to resurrect a dead character that will likely be a long, difficult, and costly process, and they likely won't return the same as they died. If a party decides to take this path upon a character's release, sorry, if the party decides to take this path upon a character's death, the GM will tell the players what it will take to make that happen. For more on this, see the section for resurrection in the GM section on page here, section pending. Sure, okay. <clears throat> There's also a one-time resurrection spell available at level 10 for any class that includes the Splendor Domain. Once the spell is used, it will go into your vault permanently. Okay, they did it. They addressed death from every possible perspective. Because here's the thing. Death in D&D, &D, sorry, death in RPGs, the RPG has to choose a 
specific approach often. And if they don't, because here's the thing, in something like Critical Role uh, that's played in 5th edition, when characters die, the initial question is not, what does the player want to do? The initial question really is, what's possible? What level are we? Is resurrection possible? How close are we to a, a temple? Is, re- is, re- is resurrection possible? How many diamonds do we have? Is resurrection possible? Then, only then, once you've answered some of these questions, yes, finally you get, does the character want to come back? And that is the wrong order. And it's not Critical Role's fault. It's kind of just the way 5e is designed. I don't think it's terrible design. I just don't think it's ideal. Because really, the most important question is, what does the player want? What does the player want to have happen? Because everyone has a different relationship with death. Some players don't want to die. That's okay. Some players love the idea that they might die. That's fine, too. Some players kind of are ready for their character to die. And that's also fine. I think I would probably hit this one more often than I should uh, because I'm a GM and I always have more ideas for player characters. They give you a choice. They give you a choice when you die. You can either just not die and keep playing the game. You're incapacitated, um, but you'll be healed and you'll get better. And you made that choice and that's fine. Or you die, but you do something awesome on the way out. I made a whole video about that. I made a whole video about, hey, wouldn't it be nice to do something cool and meaningful before you die? And then finally, it's just like, hey, do you just want to roll the die and see? Completely random. It's optional. That's cool. I like this. And again, there is an option for resurrection, but you don't get it until you are level 10 and every character can only do it once. Well, doesn't that just solve all the issues that Matt has with 5e? Role playing and resurrections because he wants resurrection to be harder and harder as you die more often. Well, <clears throat> now you can't resurrect each other as players until you're level 10. And they're going to have their own ideas for resurrection, which it doesn't look like are here. Maybe they're already in the GM section or maybe they, they haven't been written yet. Um, but either way, you know, I'm not going to talk about that today because that's not really relevant right now. What's important to me is this is awesome because it solves the death problem that RPGs struggle with overall. It's just fixed. Like, this is the solution. You give players a choice. I really like that. I think it is so interesting that Matt has been trying to deal with making his games more lethal and trying to find the balance of that throughout a good chunk of Critical Role especially throughout Vox Machina, really, really trying to figure out which approach to take. You know, I don't personally love that, you know, risk it all. If you fail, nothing, you have no impact. Like, you don't get to go out on a blaze of glory. But that's the choice you made when you risk it all, right? You either go out with nothing, you go out like a chump, or maybe you stay on your feet and you heal. Like... That's the choice. And, um, man, I like this a lot. I think that's really smart, and I think it really, really reflects the choice to evolve... To, 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 it really reflects how Matt runs his games. It really reflects the tone of their games. And it really, really reflects the fact that death doesn't have to be the way characters get written out of D&D. Because I've seen so many, so many fellow YouTubers, colleagues of mine, people I respect, people I think are terrific, say things that I think are maybe not quite true about death in D&D, where it's like, listen, I think it's necessary for the game. I'm like, I don't. I think the risk of it being there is cool and good, but what if all of your players don't want their characters to die? Okay. Well, there has to be some consequence. I saw somebody here. Um, Eek, Eek Wacker says, I would like to have an option to remove scars. That would be very interesting, and I'd be very curious to know what that looks like. But the whole point of it is there has to be a consequence to death, and that's what they're going for here. There has to be some consequence to it. If there's no consequence for scars, then there's no consequence to dying, and everyone is basically unkillable. I don't think it's a bad idea to have something like scars. I mean, it could just be, hey, listen, um, 
m- the way we're writing out my character is he's going to go get some therapy. He's going to go and finally deal with all these psychic scars he's obtained and he's going to stop fighting and go live a happy life. <clears throat> he's going to just ride off into the sunset and go to see a therapist and deal with all the times he died and all the scars he's taken. Because remember, if you've taken a scar and you filled up all your hope slots, you have died many, many times. So you've earned it, right? You've earned your rest at that point. So I'm kind of glad that, I think it makes sense that there isn't a way to undo scars because that's how they make sure there are consequences. But it would be nice if narratively characters could get through these things, which is why, you know, it, it's it's tough because it's essentially the design is being motivated from a very, like, game-centered place first. There need to be some sort of limits on characters surviving anything that, can, that they come across. So there has to be some consequence to death, so they're taking the form of scars, so inevitably your character has to stop playing. That's not terribly different from what happens when characters just level up. Like, if you're playing a game like um, Dungeon World, your characters level up asynchronously. And when your character hits a certain level, it's time for you to retire that character and bring in someone younger. This is well, someone less experienced, I should say. This is the same thing. It's just time to retire that character if they've died that many times. Um, and again, not... Uh, well, I guess that is the same thing as unconsciousness, isn't it? Which is which is going to be interesting. I'm going to see how we feel about that during playtesting. But yeah, I do... Yeah, it is unconsciousness. So it's the same thing. So that's going to really be... That's going to be the make or break is how often do you go unconscious in this game? Um, and how much do you heal? And how like There are more options for characters to heal themselves naturally. That's, that's going to that's gonna determine whether or not this works, ultimately. Yeah, but I really like this, just from what we're seeing right now. Um, all right, there are more combat rules that we skipped. And more combat rules here below, but... Oh, pardon me. Yeah, there are more combat rules, but I'm not going to talk about them today. Um, I already ran a three-hour game this morning, uh, or two-and-a-half-hour game, and we've been streaming for another two-and-a-half hours. Um, my voice is basically shot. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, a bunch Oh, a bunch more people were commenting about this, and I just had scrolled up. Um, yeah, Alexandra, it's exactly right. What is um, this? When you put a scar on your last hope slot, it's time to end your character's journey. Work with the GM to find a graceful and fitting way for the party to say goodbye to them at the end of a session and prepare for a new character for the next time you play. That's a bard's lament. That's exactly what that is. You're exactly right, Alexandra. That is that's what they're doing. Um Uh wow, yeah, so there was a lot of comments here that I missed. Um Yeah, yeah, it's it's really interesting, and, and this is go- and this is really going to be the <clears throat> this is going to be a deal breaker or a selling point for people. For me, this is a huge selling point because it solves so many of the problems with how death works in RPGs right now. That's not going to be the case for everyone. This is not the go to solution for everyone. Like there, there's absolutely an argument as well of like the there's some there's some ableism here, right? It's like at a certain point you have to stop adventuring. It is, that's kind of not deniable. Is that um, avoidable when you're, like, you call it something else? I, I don't know what else you call it because it kind of makes the most sense. Because, again, what they're going for is there has to be a point where you stop playing. <laughs> Nick, sa- Nick says, embrace death is the the Liam input. I think you are probably right. <laughs> I, I think that's probably pretty reasonable. Um, yeah, it's actually, yeah, interesting. Um I know there's a lot of discussion here, and and for people who are debating how this might work or should work, you know, feel free to comment in, in the. Um, I mean, I guess you can comment on this video. I was saying, um, feel free to to leave a submission in in um, to Daggerheart to Darrington Press and let them know. I really like this. I I do see concerns, and no one's mentioned this specifically. I don't know how the consensus is on this. I could see this feeling a little ableist as far as how scars work like people have to stop adventuring i just think it's kind of required for there to be some sort of 
consequence of failure. And at the very least, you do get to leave on your terms. And that's, I think, really smart. Using strain instead of scars. Sure, that could that could be the case. It kind of depends because scars can be psychic or like we already talked about mental scars versus physical scars. So it, it's more flexible. But I don't know. It, this is something that could also be flavored at your table. I don't know. We'll have to see. I really like this. So right now my readings are, game is not 100% there yet. But so far, I really like their death mechanic. And I like their card mechanic that you get at level five, which I wish was present more. I like a lot of this. I think there's a couple things that it could just be taken over the finish line. Um, but there's a lot of it that I'm going to be, I'm going to be really curious to play through combat. And I also haven't watched the one shot yet. I want to see combat in action as well. But I'm going to do that after I create a character, which I will try to do either tomorrow or Tuesday. We're going to see. Um, I don't know when I'm going to be able to do the live stream and create the character, but I'm going to need to. Um, Because I'm really excited to create a character for this game. And that's everything that I really wanted to cover before creating the character. Because I think the next stuff gets into to GM rules. And we'll talk about that another time. Um, after I've played, I think. Um... <laughs> Um, yeah, it'll be really interesting to see, um, combat in action. Cause I, that's going to answer a lot of my questions about like, does it work? You know, but we will have to see, um, folks will have to let me know when the ad is over. Yes. I think little hill, that's a good point. You know, it could just be emotional. It could be PTSD. Um, but it could also just be physical scars. Um, um, I, I'm glad you enjoyed the discussion. Thank you to the people who have followed me today. Um, thank you to the super chats. Um, we'll be back. Oh, I don't know yet. It'll either be tomorrow or it'll be Tuesday. It probably would not be Wednesday or Thursday. So if I don't get a chance to make a character Monday or Tuesday, then I probably won't get the chance until Friday, which would be tough. Because I also want to play this game pretty soon. Um, so we'll see. Monday or Tuesday or Friday. I will probably know more tomorrow. But that is going to be... Yeah, we'll see. Well, if if I do figure out when I'm going to stream, I'll schedule it in advance. I'll put it on YouTube. Um, part of me is like, oh, I could live stream early in the morning. But then it's also like, well, but then I'll be live streaming while my video goes live, and then <laughs> I'm cannibalizing my own content. Because I do have a video coming out tomorrow, by the way. I even though I've said that I don't do Monday videos anymore, that may not be true anymore. Check out Monday's video. Um, so, compete with Mega. <clears throat> Listen, my uh, schedule is limited right now, so unfortunately I might line up with Mega at some point. I also need to stream Baldur's Gate at some point this week. Uh, that might have to be Friday. We'll see. Um, but we will see what happens. I will talk to you all later. Um, have a wonderful rest of your day. Have an excellent evening or morning or night or whatever. And, um, yeah, I'm going to make a character soon.